And I'm going to start in about two minutes. Welcome, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well out there. I will be right back on, guys. I'm helping. Yeah, that I'm, don't worry. I'm helping Commissioner Grossman uh, get online. One moment, please. Okay. I'm not sure if that meant he wanted me to wait for him to start. I'm going to give uh, Mr. Savannah Frick minute to get back and then I will start. I think I'm going to go ahead and start and assume that Mr. Zivanefrek will get back to us uh, with us uh, momentarily as he helps Commissioner Grossman get back on. Good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order at 10.01 a.m. on Friday, May 8th. Before we get into the full meeting agenda for the postponed March 19, 2020 Chicago Plan Commission meeting, I would like to remind everyone that we are meeting virtually. And as such, please be mindful of your surroundings in terms of noise. Please remember to keep yourself muted when you are not speaking. The meeting is being recorded and also live streamed for public viewing. Lastly, if you were an active participant, if if you are an active participant in the meeting, especially if you are speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will cause audio interference. I'm gonna say that again. If you are an active participant in the meeting, especially if you are speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will cause audio interference. I also want to thank and acknowledge the, uh, the tech team who have been very diligent in helping us to get set up and with the great hope that this will run very smoothly. I want to also quickly provide guidance to those who have pre-registered to provide testimony on the cases presented for public hearing today. Those who requested to testify at the plan commission today should have already submitted testimony forms, which included the speaker's full name and address, as well as the public hearing item number and those forms have been gathered by the staff. I do have those forms in front of me. And out of respect for others, speakers sh should please limit your comments to three minutes. When your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted to allow you to make your comments. Please attempt to refrain from repeating comments that have been made by previous speakers. The public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session of staff or the applicants, but an opportunity for attendees to voice their opinions 
on a particular proposal. Out of respect for others, please do not interrupt or disrupt the speakers. Any individual who does disrupt the presentation or any subsequent comment sessions may be muted and removed from the virtual planning session. I will now call uh, the roll. Um, Commissioner Biagi. Commissioner Brumfield. Commissioner Burnett. Here. Commissioner Cordova is here. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Cox is here. Commissioner Flores. Here. Commissioner Gadiza. Here. Commissioner Grossman is on her way on. Uh, Commissioner Kelly. Commissioner Lightfoot. Commissioner Lyons. Here. Commissioner Moore. Here. Commissioner Murphy. Was here. He's Commissioner Murphy. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Novada. Commissioner Osterman. Here. Oh, yes. Okay. Commissioner Peterson. Commissioner Dreyas. Here. Commissioner Searle. Here. Commissioner Shaw. Here. Commissioner Sposato. Commissioner Tunney. Here. Commissioner Villegas. And Commissioner Wegesbach. Here. Fantastic. Great that all of you are here. And we will now approve the minutes from the last regularly scheduled planned commission meeting that were distributed prior to, the, to today's hearing. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the February 21st, 2020 meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission? So moved. moved. Second. Who was that? Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Uh, Commissioner Shaw, I'm sorry. Commissioner Shaw, seconded by? Commissioner Garrison. Commissioner Garrison, thank you. And I'm doing that uh, to make sure that, um, that it gets captured on the record. I'm all in favor of the proposal to approve the minutes from the February 21st, 2020 meeting is signified by saying aye. 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 Um, any nays? Any abstentions? That motion passes. We will now move to hear matters in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. Prior to commencing the public hearings, we have one case for which the applicant- Chairman? Oh, never mind. Go ahead is seeking a deferral. Um, the, the item is listed as C2 on the posted agenda. The proposed plan development submitted by Greater Chicago Food Depository for the property generally located at 41-4230 West and Lurie Place and 4040-4210 South Carlove Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the subject property from M2-3 Light Industry District to Industrial Institutional Plan Development. The applicant proposes a 64,300 square foot addition to an existing 275,000 square foot food warehouse and packaging facility to add a meal preparation facility and ancillary improvements, housing accessory office, food and beverage service, medical service, educational, community volunteer, and um, outreach. Uh, I lost out, uh, volunteer uh, and outreach uses and related accessory and incidental uses. The overall plan development will contain 306 accessory vehicular parking stalls and 23 loading berths. The proposal is located in the 14th ward. And let me note for the record that Commissioner Brumsfeld has joined us, as has Commissioner Novada as has Commissioner Biagi. Did I miss anyone else? Okay, do I have a motion uh, um, that before I, well, go ahead. Do I have a motion for this item, to defer this item? So moved. Moved, moved by Commissioner Shaw. Shaw, seconded by? Seconded, seconded by Commissioner Searle. Um, 
before I uh, ask for the vote on this, um, I'm sure we all, uh, you all join me in thanking and acknowledging the work of the food depository um, during, during this time. Uh, we know they've been working very hard, which we presume is part of their reason for the request for this deferral um, and getting food to various people throughout the city. So uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All, any, Aye. Nays? Aye. any nays and any abstentions? Motion passes. Uh, let me also note for the record that Commissioner Kelly has also arrived. Uh, now we will take public testimony for today's agenda. I have one person signed in to speak today. Um, he is requested to speak on item C1, the Woodlawn Plan Consolidation Report. Mr. Butler Adams, I will unmute your microphone. Actually, tech support will help me do that. And you may proceed. Please be reminded that you will have three minutes to speak. I do have a, a uh, clock in front of me. So with that, Mr. Butler, um, or excuse me, Mr. Adams, uh, welcome to the CPC meeting and you may proceed. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, good morning, and I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, my name is Butler Adams, and I uh, wanted to say once again, I am in support of this Woodlawn proposal. Um, again, it's been kind of a long time coming to have any type of uh, decent activity and development in this neighborhood, and it's nice to see a, a plan that's actually uh, finally coming together. Uh, one thing that I would like in, in, in terms of this particular plan that has not really been talked about is the re-extension of the green line to the uh, Metro Electric tracks to the east um, with the Obama Presidential Center soon to be constructed in Jackson Park. It seems like this tentacle of transportation needs to be restored. Um, I said a lot of what I want, a lot of what I wanted to say last time back in February when this uh, uh, item was initially deferred. Um, but again, I would just certainly like uh, more density, more uh, great architecture in this neighborhood. Again, the population has declined from 81,000 back in 1960 to about 23,000 today. So that is certainly a, a significant population loss. And it's something we need to rebuild here in this particular uh, uh, area. Had an opportunity to go to the uh, Woodlawn Summit once again uh, a few months ago, the fourth one that I've been to. And once again, they just talked about some of the neighborhood uh, neighborhood issues. I know that with this particular plan, there are the potential of high, rise in, high rises in the area, especially near uh, Stony Island. And I certainly would be uh, in favor of, of that happening. But uh, once again, I would just like to see some, some great architecture in this neighborhood, some great density in this neighborhood. I know that we do have a lot of city owned property and I know that the, the new alderman uh, wants a significant amount of that to be uh, affordable housing. And I certainly think that we should have affordable housing in, in the neighborhood, but Chicago is a city of 230 square miles. So let's do spread out spread that out throughout all 50 wards. But other than that, um, I do approve this plan. I look forward to, uh, again, the construction happening in this neighborhood. And I know that we're uh, doing a little bit of uh, different zoning, uh, form-based zoning, potentially in the neighborhoods. And I do hope that a, a kind of a downtown neighborhood form-based zoning uh, can be discussed and brought up. But other than that, I look forward to my neighborhood uh, being able to move forward um, uh, and has some of the things that Hyde Park does have of some walkability, a uh, downtown, restaurants you can go to, something that this neighborhood is, is sorely lacking. But uh, that's pretty much about all that I have. But I do, again, support this, uh, the coming together of all the plans over the years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Adams. And with 10 seconds to spare, um, now we will move on to the public hearing presentation portion for matters submitted in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. The first item on the agenda is a proposed resolution recommending the approval of the Woodlawn Plan Consolidation Report. The report reviews past plans that were developed for Woodlawn, identifies where they align, and outlines recommendations that the City of Chicago can implement to achieve neighborhood goals, including through the disposition of city-owned vacant land. The report covers the Woodline community area generally bounded by Martin Luther King Drive and South Chicago Avenue on the west, 60th Street on the north, Stony Island Avenue on the east, and 67th Street and South Cottage Grove Avenue on the south. 
This report covers properties in the 5th and 20th wards. Nolan Zoroff, CPC staff, will, CPD staff, DP, uh, will present the proposed plan. Nolan? Good morning. Can, can everyone see my screen? We can. Great. Uh, so good morning, Chair, members of the Commission. Again, for the record, my name is Nolan Zaroff with the Department of Planning and Development. Um, I am here this morning to present to you the Woodlawn Plan Consolidation Report, which covers the entire Woodlawn community area, including portions of the 5th and 20th wards on Chicago's south side. This report was developed by the Department of Planning and Development over the last year and a half. And we did bring this item before you at the February 21st meeting of the Plan Commission, uh, but that at, time, at that time we presented it as informational only in order to provide additional time for public comment and socialization of the report. Today, however, we are recommending this report for Plan Commission approval. Um, so Woodlawn is a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, adjacent to both the University of Chicago and the site of the future Obama Presidential Center. It is home to about 23,000 residents. That's down 3% from 2010. Its population peaked at nearly 81,000 in 1960. The median household income in Woodlawn is about $25,000 a year compared to a citywide median of about 52,000. And the neighborhood has a diverse mix of land uses, but it is predominantly residential. Uh, there has been an increase in residential renovation and new construction activity since 2010. Uh, total permit volumes are up nearly 7% and the value of residential property sales has increased more than 9% over the same period. And this map just shows Woodlawn in context, its proximity to the University of Chicago and the future Obama Presidential Center. The community is well served by transit with access to both the CTA Green Line and Metro Electric Commuter Rail, and is a short drive to the loop by a Lakeshore Drive or the Dan Ryan Expressway to the list. Um, and sort of the reason why we're here this morning and why this report has come together is because um, over the past 20 years, more than a dozen plans and studies have been developed for Woodlawn. And this is just a sampling of the covers from these past plans and studies. Um, some of these were commissioned by the city, but the vast majority of them were developed by nonprofits and local community organizations and involved extensive community engagement. The number of plans developed for Woodlawn demonstrates how many people and organizations care about the neighborhood, but it also underscores the need for one unified path forward. And so, as I mentioned, over the last 18 months, uh, DPD has worked to consolidate these past plans and studies into the Woodlawn Plan Consolidation Report, uh, which contains a full analysis of those plans and studies. It provides a review of demographics, current conditions, and future trends for Woodlawn, and identifies actions that the city, its partner agencies, and the community more broadly can take to move these goals and ideas forward. Um, and based on comments we received by the Plan Commission in February, as well as additional public input we've received since then, uh, we incorporated a number of additional elements into the report. Uh, these include uh, reviewing and integrating the findings of the Woodlawn Housing Data Project, which was developed by WECAN and the University of Chicago in September of 2019, um, including a table that describes some of the investments that have occurred in Woodlawn since 2000 and how they may have addressed goals articulated in past plans and studies and also expanding on the housing policy and goals in the recommendation section to integrate and reflect the ongoing conversation that the Department of Housing is having in the community around housing affordability um, and housing provision. Um, so again, being responsive to the feedback we received, um, it's important to recognize that, that some of the recommendations identified in past plans have already been implemented. Um, there is now a full service grocery store at 61st and Cottage Grove. Murals have been painted below the Metro viaducts and art has been installed in other locations in the neighborhood. The city has awarded more than $2 million in neighborhood opportunity fund grants to local businesses. And there's been millions of dollars in investment by POA and the Renew Woodlawn program, particularly along Cottage Grove Avenue. Um, but again, these efforts have not necessarily been coordinated and have not been responsive to all of the goals that have been identified in past plans and studies. Um, and so this just shows, again, um, this is the chart that has been included in the report that identifies um, investment that has occurred over the last 20 years and how it's been responsive to some of those goals and recommendations in past plans and studies. Um, and again, it's important to underscore that these ideas come from plans and studies that already reflect extensive community engagement over nearly two decades. The DPD has also engaged stakeholders in a variety of ways during the development of this report. Um, including participating in one Woodlawn planning meetings hosted by the Network of Woodlawn in 2018 and 2019, uh, conducting targeted stakeholder interviews and attending Department of Housing working group meetings in the fall of 2019, 
to conducting a public open house on January 30th of this year that was attended by more than 200 residents and community stakeholders. Um, since February 21st, when we first brought this to plan commission, um, we've also extended the public comment period an additional 30 days. Um, and DPD staff and the commissioner um, attended the Woodlawn Community Summit on March 7th um, to continue to engage stakeholders and get the word out about this report. Um, and this slide is just an illustration, again, of that analysis that DPD conducted um, to, you know, sort of identify goals and studies um, across the plans and studies that have been um, developed for Woodlawn over the last 20 years. Um, and I would just highlight um, the, the kind of light blue box on the leftmost uh, chart is showing how we've incorporated um, the, that 2019 uh, weekend in University of Chicago study into the report as well. Um, and so from our analysis of past plans and studies, um, there were nine broader goals that were identified. Um, these are the goals for housing, which include supporting existing residents and addressing displacement, um, expanding housing choice, um, including affordable housing options and home ownership opportunities to make sure that a range of housing exists for different household sizes and income levels, and encouraging the reinvestment in housing stock to ensure that there is sufficient quality housing in the neighborhood. Um, the Department of Housing has really taken the lead in these engagement efforts around housing goals and developing policies and programs that address those concerns. Um, but since this was uh, since the item was before you in February, we have worked with the Department of Housing to incorporate their goals and programs more fully into this report. Um, and I have a slide later on in this presentation that illustrates that. Um, regarding commercial corridors, uh, past plans articulate the importance of expanding local ownership and neighborhood retail to provide more options for residents and visitors, uh, redeveloping vacant buildings and lots along former commercial corridors, particularly the city owned land along 63rd Street, and reestablishing 63rd as a neighborhood center similar to other thriving retail corridors across the city. And then finally, goals related to the public realm include improving pedestrian conditions uh, like streetscaping along 63rd Street, um, also identifying opportunities for new open space and recreational amenities in the community. Um, closely related to this, improving internal and external linkages to Woodlawn uh, through improved pedestrian, bicycle and transportation connections. Um, and finally, addressing real and perceived safety concerns to make sure that residents and visitors feel safe spending time in Woodlawn and enjoying the neighborhood and its many assets. So that gets us to report recommendations. Uh, what can the city do to move some of these ideas forward? Um, first, we recommend targeting greater density along 63rd Street around CTA stations and the Metro Station um, and those other transit nodes um, to reestablish 63rd Street as a neighborhood center and provide more housing options through mixed use development. Uh, second, we recommend visioning for future density with residents and the community stakeholders along major corridors and at decommissioned Chicago public school sites. Uh, the report recommends preserving the existing character of residential streets by developing re vacant residential land in a way that matches existing neighborhood context. And better targeting and coordinating city resources to support local business development. The report recommends working with residents, the Chicago Park District, and neighbor space to identify opportunities for new open space amenities, particularly in Southwest Woodlawn, uh, which is the farthest from Jackson Park, Washington Park, and other open space opportunities. And then finally, working with CDOT to scope for potential streetscape improvements along 63rd Street. This is an example um, of Surmac Road in Pilsen that just sort of shows um, what a difference even some modest streetscaping can do to improve the pedestrian realm. Um, and so how do we propose uh, to start implementing these recommendations? Uh, DPD proposes developing a zoning overlay district for Woodlawn, which would clarify and organize zoning to ensure that new development conforms to the community's vision and achieves the goals articulated by past plans and studies, as well as any housing and affordability goals that have come out of the Department of Housing work in Woodlawn. The proposed zoning overlay district would include a form-based code, which would help to guide the physical form of new development, uh, here you can see examples from Detroit, which used form-based code to manage the redevelopment of a neighborhood there. Um, and it includes zoning standards that people are familiar with, um, but is more visual and focuses more on the physical form that construction takes as opposed to floor area ratios, uses, and things like that. Um, the form-based code would also articulate design guidelines to ensure that new development really honors Woodlawn's character and fits the existing context. And then of course, continuing to collaborate with and support the Department of Housing in their efforts to develop policies and programs to address concerns around housing affordability and opportunity in Woodlawn. Um, to that end, we have added a section to the report that identifies those housing goals 
um, which you can see on the left side of this, uh, this chart, and what existing and potential new programs can help to achieve these goals. Um, and then finally, of course, um, continuing to engage the community. A DPD Southeast Region planning team would continue to engage residents, stakeholders, and community groups in Woodlawn um, throughout the implementation of this and any future planning efforts. So looking forward, uh, next steps would include working to implement the zoning overlay district through a range of engagement activities, as well as engaging the public to vision for future, uh, future of the decommissioned schools um, in the neighborhood and the commercial corridors. Um, we anticipate hiring a consultant to assist in information gathering, analysis, and community engagement around these efforts. Um, NDPD would, of course, continue its coordination efforts with the Department of Housing um, on achieving the targets that they develop with stakeholders around affordability and housing mix. Um, so that concludes my presentation. At this time, I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. I want to remind commissioners that uh, they can raise their hands uh, on the... Um... Uh, through your little raise your hand uh, button. And so at this time, uh, do I have any questions of, of the staff from, from the commissioners? No questions, I have a question. Um, so you, you in, the, um, in that implementation section, you have, you have a, some, something about affordable housing, but I'm wondering why of your six goals, you don't list housing um, as a as one of those major goals? Um, I think all of these goals, all of these goals pertain to housing. These are all housing goals. Commissioner, um, others may have follow up question for that. I would have liked to seen it listed in among those six goals, but Commissioner Burnett. Yes, uh, I just want to ask, uh, whose ward is this? What ward? Which ward? I know Woodline cover a couple of wards. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's Commissioner. It's Alderman Harrison and Alderman Taylor. Okay. And and how is the how are the uh, aldermen incorporated into this? So we have engaged the aldermen throughout the process. Um, we've briefed them several times on this and, and received their input and their feedback. Um, both aldermen and their staff have also been uh, very involved in the Department of Housing's uh, working groups and efforts there last fall. So, so they're on board? Uh, we, have, we have briefed both of them and their staff. Um, we have not received um, any type of correspondence either way. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Cyril? Uh, just as, before we go on, uh, Chairman, do we want to, um, Alderman Harrison's on, do we want to let her say a few words? Yes, because I was going to go to that next, and I uh, thank you for letting me know that she's on, um, Vice Chair um, Shaw. Um, Alderman, would you like to speak? Alderman Harrison, would you like to speak before I call on Commissioner Searle? Um, yes, I would. I'm, I'm a little concerned that Alderman uh, Jeanette Taylor is, is not on the call. Is she on the call? Um... I don't think she is. I don't see her on here. Because the majority of this is in her uh, ward. I just have a small portion of it. Um, I, I did, and my staff and I did attend, you know, each of the meetings. Uh, there were con some, some concerns. Um, but I, I, I really think that um, since most of this is in her ward, um, she should really have have something to say on it well let me let me just say for the record that that uh that alder woman taylor uh, was invited um she was informed about this and she was invited we didn't we didn't um we didn't get an acceptance from here for this meet for from her for this meeting did you call her so that would be a question that staff could answer um, in, in, as far as um, the invitation to this meeting, I, I know, um, I'm not sure what um, CPC staff have done, um, but um, myself, um, Jim Harbin from our team, uh, Lisa Washington from the Southeast Planning Region um, lead, we did brief her staff a uh, week before last. Um, okay, so let me stop you right there. The question was a very direct question. Did you pick up the phone and call her? I can't speak to other CPC staff members. I did not uh, pick up the phone and call her this week. 
Okay, well, it would seem to me that if you were presenting before the plan commission something in an alderman's ward and you had not heard back from him or her, that you would pick up the phone and call them, particularly since everybody is working remotely. And she may not get the emails directly, it might go to her staff, um, but it seems like a very simple thing to do. I mean, I got an invite, but um, I have several things that, that are in the hopper and I didn't know what it was and it would have been, it, it would have been appropriate to follow up with the call and say, this is coming up. I mean, I, I don't have any problems, um, you know, with the, the, the consolidation plan because it is just a plan. Um, but I am concerned um, about um, the department not engaging um, enough with the alderman to, to, to know that this, this is something uh, that she wants to see in a majority of her ward. Um, and I do not feel comfortable speaking on her behalf. Um, you know, the few blocks that I have in Woodlawn, I, I can address, and most of that is developed already. Um, but a lot of the larger plan um, is in the 20th ward, and she has been the one engaging with her community um, and, and would know better. So I'm a little concerned that she is not a part of this. Um, Commissioner Searle, before I go to you for your questions uh, directly on the project, I'm going to call on uh, Commissioner Villegas um, to, uh, on this point. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman. Um, is the Commissioner Cox on the line? I think that uh, Alderman Harrison posed the question and, and uh, the Planning Commission um, should, have been re should have reached out to Alderwoman Taylor. So I wanted to see if uh, Commissioner Cox, uh, anyone from his staff reached out to the alderman, given so that. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Given that the majority of the projects is in her ward. So um, let, I'm going to call on Commissioner Cox here in just a second. I think um, oh. let me let me go ahead and re, re, before I do, let me repeat what uh, uh, Mr. Zaroff said, which is that a, that a um, uh, I guess an email was was sent to her staff, and um, but I think uh, the point is certainly well taken. And you know, normally when we reach out, and again, we're not in normal times right now, but uh, mm -hmm. the alder, uh, various alder men and women, um, uh, or their staff will will respond one way or another. But I do think, and I'm going to request of staff that we make it a matter of policy that if we don't hear back, once we've made that initial outreach that if we don't hear back that in fact we do make sure that um, that that follow-up um, is made. I think I was assuming that was the case because we do have a pretty high rate of alder folks getting back to us when we reach out to them but again we're not in normal times right now so I think that uh, what you're saying um, alder woman is uh, it, person is is very important so I think as a matter of policy henceforth it's staff I'm directing that if we don't hear back from um, the elder uh, man or woman uh, or their staff, um, then there is follow-up and concerted effort made to reach them. Um, Commissioner Cox, do you want to respond to uh, Commissioner Villegas' um, point or question? Uh, uh, certainly, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, uh, and uh, Alderman Harrison. Um, as, you, as you know, this has been a multi-month uh, process uh, from the very beginning when the consolidate plan was being formed, um, staff have taken um, the old woman through the presentation we're seeing today, um, page by page. Uh, I, I was, uh, I personally attended those sessions with her, just uh, myself, the DPD staff, and the old woman and her staff. Uh, so she, um, she understands the full content of it. Uh, and um, I don't believe has formalized her position in, uh, in favor or, uh, or, uh, or against. Uh, she, she simply hasn't um, chosen to, um, to say that. Um, she also um, was under uh, full 
uh, notification that uh, uh, that this was being brought to the plan commission today. Okay. Uh, and um, and as, you, as so, I, I can't um, I can't um, explain the the presence or the lack of presence of her today. Uh, but she was aware of the meeting, aware that it was on the agenda, uh, uh, is fully aware of the content of the recommendations. Um, and so I, I think the effort that um, was necessary, did I make a call to her last night uh, to say, uh, uh, to remind her one more time that it was on the uh, agenda today? No, I did not uh, do that. And you don't have any emails from her this morning? We do not. This is, uh, yeah, uh, Commissioner, I was not insinuating that, that you should have made a call. No, no, um, I understand. You know, and, and, and I've, I've been at the meetings, you've been at the meetings. I, I was just concerned that that was all. Well, this is, this is great, Commissioner Alderman. I mean, uh, Alderman Harrison, we really appreciate you raising this. Um, Commissioner Osterman. So um, I just spoke to Alderman Taylor. She'd like to be on the call and, um, I think that if we could have staff reach out to her um, um, with the uh, call in number, um, I think we would, I think her feedback um, would be appreciated. Okay, so then how, um, Commissioner Shaw, um, maybe you can advise me, how do I then, can I defer this item or until later in the agenda, how, how should we proceed here? Because we do want to give her a chance, but I don't want to just sit here in silence while we're waiting for her either. Chairman, mm -hmm. uh, Chairman, this is Commissioner Wagesback. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner, thank you. Um, can the, can uh, we get an explanation for the public about the next steps for this type of plan? So where does it go from here once it passes the plan commission? There you go, that'll, that, all right. So let me, but before, uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna, that's great. That's a great time user. And I think it's an important piece of information. Meanwhile, staff, if you're working with Alderman Taylor to get her on this call, that would be awesome. And maybe by the time we're uh, at the point of needing to vote, we, we, could, uh, we, we could have her on. Um, I know Commissioner Searle is waiting with some questions, but I'm gonna call on Commissioner Burnett because it may be specific to this particular issue. Um, um, go ahead, um, Commissioner Burnett. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Alderman Taylor just called me. She, we just spoke. She's getting the um, she's getting the info, and she should be signing in pretty soon. Fantastic. Okay, then let me go ahead and go to Commissioner Searle, and then I'm going to go uh, uh, call on someone who can who can answer the question that, um, that Commissioner Wagespot put forward, which is the questions around where do we go from here. And by the time we get those uh, questions addressed or discussed, uh, we should have Alderman Taylor on the phone. So Commissioner Searle, you first with your question. Thank you for your patience. You're unmuted. Nope, now you're unmuted. Go ahead, Commissioner Searle. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my, my comment, what, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my comment was um, that I thought in these next steps, uh, there is one statement about visioning around uh, decommissioned schools and commercial corridor, but I think what we really ought to be saying here is that this is a great opportunity for this to be what we might call an innovation zone, because there's so much opportunity for improvement and for uh, development. Um, <clears throat> and that, that zone really should carefully connect to the... Um, Obama Center, in whatever way that's possible, uh, there are, I'm sure, going to be development opportunities for uh, hotels and things that will directly relate to the Obama Center. And this is like the perfect neighborhood for some of that to happen. So it should, of course, relate to people, the residents who live there. But on the other hand, it should be uh, a center where we're gonna draw people from all around the country to come and visit. So, uh, and that can only do good things also for the neighborhood. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Thrill. There may be folks who wanna to respond to that, but we, um, we do have Alderman Taylor um, on the phone. So we're delighted, Alderman Taylor, that, that you are here. 
uh, we do want to get your response uh, to the consolidated plan that is before the California Commission this morning. So good morning. I don't know if you all could see me. We can. We sure can. Thank you. Okay. Um, I can't see y'all. Can you? Okay. You all can hear me well, correct? We can, but right now we're looking at your keyboard. So if you're able to. Okay. Read, Let me turn it back around. There, okay, you, go. there you go. All right. Thank you. So good morning. For me, um, I don't support the, the zone because it doesn't seem like that people would have to come to this office and have a conversation. And we've already kind of set a platform for people to do development. And so I want us to have a longer conversation, but I don't think um, doing it this way is it, especially not for me. I've already had a gentleman to set up a CDB shop um, because he can get a license to do so without following um, the process that myself and the community um, has set up. And so this is not, I would like for us to go back to the table and not pass this right now because we need to come up with a way that not only protects, um, that includes not just my office, but the constituents in the community. And I don't feel like this process does that. And I didn't get the information about the call. If I would have and know that this was a part of it, I would have been on the call. Uh, do any of the commissioners have a question for, for the older woman? Yes, I do. Alderman Burnett. <clears throat> I mean, commissioner. Yes. Uh, well, commissioner Burnett. So, so Alderman, um, just for your reference, I've had in, in some parts of my ward, uh, I've had four plans. Uh, plans evolve and they change. Um, but I don't know if you're under the impression that if you do a plan, it can stop someone who has a right to do something regardless of the plan or not, like a CB, CD, CBD uh, uh, office. I don't, a plan don't, uh, 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 so from my understanding, a plan don't really stop anything. It just sort of directs things. So if it has to get approval from you or the city, we direct them to that plan. But if they have a right to open up uh, a business uh, legally uh, and they zone for it, uh, that plan can't stop that, right? Unless you change the zoning uh, in that area in order to, to stop certain things from opening up. So I think uh, it sound like to me, uh, planning that I think you all may need to really explain um, explain a little more to the uh, alderman so she can get a full grasp of what the plan is and, and what the plan can and can't do. Uh, yeah, I want to. Like I say, I've been through, just in the West Loop, I've had about three or four plans and they evolve and they change every day. And, uh, and it doesn't give, um, it, uh, the only way it gives direct control of what's going on if you change the zoning in the area. And that's a different type of plan. So you all may want to uh, have those discussions. Uh, it sounds as though that, that uh, it, you, you need to get a full understanding. And if I can help and help with any of that, please, please let me know. Uh, I'd love to help uh, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, I um, Mr. Narloff, I was going to call on you, but uh, Commissioner Cox has his hand up to speak, and I'm assuming he's going to directly address the comments that have been raised by Commissioner Burnett. Um, Commissioner Cox, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, happy, happy to. Uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, Alderman Burnett, for uh, offering that up. Um, the The consolidated plan is really. Um, advisory to the community, advisory to the aldermen, and advisory to uh, to um, the DPD staff. Um, it does not uh, it the the plan. Um, if the plan commission approves it, um, it is it stops there. Uh, it does not. Um, um, replace the, the aldermen's um, 
ability to uh, influence uh, the outcome of subsequent projects. Uh, it simply uh, is a, a consensus uh, that is a part of been kind of 10 years in the making uh, and guides, uh, it gives everyone a sense uh, that we are in agreement that 63rd Street will be a community center, that there's a place for density uh, east of the um, metro stations, uh, the metro tracks, uh, that there is a, um, a priority given to retaining residents and increasing the affordable housing. So these are, are kind of the aspirations that we all uh, have come to agree on. Um, they will continue to be debated. Uh, they will continue to be um, um, you know, challenged. Uh, but when all is said and done, if someone comes uh, and let's say proposes something that really the alderman doesn't agree with or the community doesn't agree with, we have a document that we can go back to and say, um, no uh, a high rise tower can't happen on 63rd uh, across from the new charter school because here are a set of guidelines that we as a community have agreed on. Uh, so it's very helpful and I would say that it's very difficult to proceed if we don't have a, a plan that consolidates all of these different plans um, because we won't have anything to push back on. We won't be able to say, well, the community uh, said this and said that, uh, and the plan commission as a body that is advisory um, endorsed it. And so I, I, I think Alderman Taylor should see it as a way um, to, it's a point in time, it, 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 it helps us to validate where the community was in 2020, uh, and as I said, the community will continue to change. Uh, your leadership will continue to guide uh, how we um, refer to this document. Um, but it is not the um, last word, uh, but it is a, um, a pretty robust reflection and record of what has been said over the past 10 years. And I really think that's all it is. It's mean to guide and advise, um, and that is the extent. Um, Commissioner uh, Alderwoman Taylor, would you like to respond? I would. So for me, I don't see what the rush is. That's number one. That's number two. I agree. Everybody hasn't seen these ten to twenty plans that you're talking about, Commissioner Stop, uh, Commissioner Cox. And my my pushback is us having a longer conversation and us waiting to pass this through. It seems like this is rushed. Um, there are a lot of my constituents who come to these meetings who support what's going on in the community, but don't have access to this platform right now. The thought that the survey for Woodline only had one person to fill out the survey is problematic. And I don't know why you all don't see it that way. And so what I'm asking is, what, what uh, Alderman Burnett said is uh, us to have a more in-depth conversation, but for this to wait and for it to be pushed through doesn't seem fair to me or to a community who has been waiting for this investment way before I even moved in the community. Um, I think, I think in, embedded in, that, in those comments is perhaps the, the, the thought for us to consider uh, postponing making any, any decision um, today. Um, I'm gonna hold that thought for just one quick second and ask um, Mr. Narlov, to go in your slides, to go back to the section with the six, the, um, those six, uh, the six goals. Okay, so the support existing, expanding housing choice, including affordable, okay, encourage reinvestment in existing housing. Those are themes. And then didn't you have like a set of where you had laid out these Keep going, you can go forward. Yeah. And then there are these three, and then there are three more. There are nine overarching goals that came out of the past plans and studies. Okay. Um, additionally, I would point out that- um, I think it was that, so that list, that, that oh, list. The recommendations, so- yeah. Those right there, I think those, starting with the target greater density, what's the second one there? 
So again, I think the important point to take away from this is that these recommendations provide a framework. And so, you know, at the time that these were developed, um, the Department of Housing was still having conversations with the community around affordable housing goals, um, uh, ownership goals. And so we wrote these recommendations in a way to provide flexibility so that when some of those housing goals were, were sort of solidified, they could fit within this framework. So we talk about targeting greater density along 63rd, which provides opportunities for, you know, denser and mixed use housing. Um, again, we talk about future density. Um, we talk about preserving the existing character within the neighborhoods. These, these uh, recommendations don't speak directly to, you know, X percentage should be affordable, X percentage should be market rate, X percentage should be home ownership. Um, those, were, those were goals that the Department of Housing was working on that would fit within or nest within these six broad recommendations. Um, so, so, all right, cool. let me see on one, two, three, target greater density. Number two is vision for future density. Number three is preserve existing character. Number four is target and coordinate city resources. Number five is identify, identify open space opportunities. Number six is potential streetscape improvements. People are gonna go to that list of six when they see these as action items. I wanna say for the record that I'm really concerned, even though you haven't mentioned in other sections, that there isn't something there in this list that is geared directly to the issue that I continually hear Woodlawn neighborhoods speak about, which is their fear of displacement um, and the issue of not only preserving the affordable housing that exists, yeah. um, but also making sure that more is added. And so um, I will- Wait, I hold on. So, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable enough with that. Um, and I, so I don't need to hear sort of why not or, or but I, 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 I actually, if we were to take a vote, I would vote against this because I really feel that um, it needs to be, um, there needs to be something in that section specifically that addresses it. And then the other thing that Commissioner Searle mentioned is that th this, and, and doesn't seem to be mentioned any place in the document, is the context here for the arrival, uh, what, uh, what, what is likely to be the arrival of the Obama Foundation um, facilities. And that is an important context to consider in thinking about this. So, uh, but, but let, me, let me go to other commissioners and ask, um, because Commissioner Taylor, I'm excuse me, Older Woman Taylor has indicated that she has some, um, some uh, issues around her comfort level here. So I'm gonna go to Alderman Burnett, I mean, excuse me, Commissioner Burnett, Commissioner Osterman, and then back to you, um, Commissioner Burnett. Well, well, thank you again. I, I just want to say, so uh, in, in some of our communities, uh, some of the plans that I've been through, and, and I actually encourage plans in my ward, because what it does is it helps to bring people together and help to yeah. get them to have the same vision of what the community can be. Once people have a vision and a goal, then you know uh, it, it, it encourages folks to start moving in that direction. And if you can do that with the city and the community together, and, and from these plans that I've experienced, they get, the, they get all the input from the community and, and they set these goals and planning gets on board. And then when resources come about in order to make these things happen, it's easier to put it toward Toward the uh, toward planning because it's part of the plan that they've written with you in the community. So it's basically a goal. It's not a a, a real controlling factor, but it but it's um, a controlling document. But it is a document that lead and guide. But it also encourages a community that may not have ever had a goal or ever envisioned that their community can change. It gives them a vision of seeing some kind of change coming about in the future and it puts everyone on the same page. So that, that's the good part about a plan. And I've always tried to encourage that, especially in my communities where we didn't have a lot of uh, development uh, for which I'm doing in, in Garfield Park and near West Side right now in order to get everyone on the same page and try to come up with some things. So that's the good part about having a plan. Um, you know, um, but making sure that everyone's engaged. And I, I would have only thought that um, you all having this plan that the alderman was engaged with the community as they came up 
with the plan. Me, myself, personally, I just allow the community to get their input and, and we move in the direction that the community wants to go uh, in regards to it, as long as it don't hurt anyone else, right? Uh, because we're not in the business of helping people to, and hurting someone else. But other than that, I kind of let the community drive where they think this thing uh, wants to go. And that has been, uh, that, that has helped me to get a buy-in from the community to help me to accomplish some of these goals that they want and get planning to help me to, comp to accomplish some of those goals that the community want. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Osterman. Um, as always, um, I'll fail in being as eloquent as Walter, but I just wanna reinforce what he said. And that's um, from his many years of experience in um, pulling development along, I think um, it's important that there's a shared vision and that the plan is used as a tool and that all the key stakeholders, including the aldermen, um, support that. In good times, if there's a good plan, there are still challenges in implementing that plan. Um, having heard this presentation before, um, I think it's a very in-depth and, and solid plan, but I think it's important that the community embraces it uh, because there are gonna be people that come to the Alderman with ideas um, and if the community and her and the entire and the city are on the same page, that gives us the best chance. It gives her the best chance. It gives the city the best chance. Most importantly, it gives the community that this is intended to help the best chance to see these plans implemented, even in a very challenging time, which we're in. So I think um, what I would request would be, uh, and the other real quick point I'll make is this, independent of this, there are issues related to housing that. Um, the city department of housing has been working on with the alderman um, that's a little bit separate but it's i think also it's very much a part of this and very important in the overall framework of the community i think what i would ask would be that we would um, take the time to have planning um, go in depth with the alderman on this plan and potentially have a meeting however maybe with the community to really look at this. And I'll say from my perspective, I think it's a solid plan, but I think it's important that um, the, the alderman understands it, and I think planning has to kind of walk her through and her community and get their feedback on it before the plan commission um, uh, acts on it. I think given the time frame that we're in, um, I think we would have the time to do that. So respectfully, I would ask that they do that um, before we would move forward on this. Thank you, commissioner. Um, Alderwoman Taylor. Thank you. Um, Alderman Ostrin, you were, you, you hit the nail on the point that this does not need to be separate to me from housing. And because we have not kind of finished what will happen at housing, those need to be conversations that are kind of tied together. And so I'm asking that a couple of things happen that we come back to the table with this community, maybe at the end of the month, I'm willing to have another um, board night. My board night was already paying for next week and it's around COVID and pre-existing conditions, but I'm willing to have a meeting at the end of the month that my staff, myself and the Planning and Housing Commission should help to do outreach for, to get as many people's buy-in as possible. Because part of my problem is there are not enough people to say, you know, nay, I agree, or nay, I disagree at the, the time that we're in, um, we're kind of on this stay home order. And so respecting this community is important because you got stakeholders who have been through all 10 plans. And for them to just say, okay, we're gonna pull bits and pieces out of a plan and the community hasn't had the opportunity to weigh in is unfair to them. And that's not what I was elected for. And so I'm asking that you all hold off on this really basically. If I can, I'm sorry, if I can jump in, I, I do think it's important to understand that this is not, um, this is not DPD cherry picking pieces from those plans and deciding what's important and what isn't. This is really us looking at all of them, all of these plans that the community ha has already um, provided their, their voice to and seeing where they come together, where do they meet, where do they align on certain things so that we can start to move those things forward if they haven't already been addressed in the last 20 years and over 14 plans. And I think it's important to understand that this really is the beginning of the conversation. This is the point in time 
to say, here is encapsulated in one document what the community has said over 20 years, what they need to see in their community. And then how do we have the conversation with the community, with elected officials going forward to start to take action on those things? And move them forward? Thank you, Mr. Nyleff. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, because we're gonna need to, to move towards some resolution here. Um, what I'd like to do, um, I wanna give uh, Commissioner Nevada a chance to speak. We haven't heard from her on this issue, but then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, ask uh, for the public record and for clarification, um, a, a very succinct statement from uh, from staff on what the public process was. Um, but then I'm going to also uh, ask for, uh, given that there are so many unresolved issues here, um, I, I, I guess I have a question that I'm going to ask and then depending on the answer, uh, seek, seek perhaps a deferral on this item. I'm going to ask the question about uh, whether there's any particular reason why we need to vote on it today and what if there's any harm in not voting on it today to at least uh, I think we're very very close if we do end up deferring it we're very close but we do we may need that time so uh, let me go to Commissioner uh, Nevada first um, and then I'll go to to whoever on the staff you can do I think it's going to be Noah um, um, who will uh, uh, who will lay out a very um, or someone, or sorry, not Nola, uh, Nola, Nolan, who a very, very, um, a very uh, quick overview, very succinct statement about what the public process was. So go ahead, Commissioner Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Cordova. Uh, I, I did just wanna speak to, um, and, and really reiterate and speak to Alderwoman Taylor's um, statement about the ways that we could tie these two conversations together. I think that the way that the planning department has viewed it is that uh, the component of the housing conversation that the Department of Housing has been leading since October is very much embedded in this and that we are um, in those spaces addressing the concerns about displacement and, and the proactive planning against that in within that realm. And I think uh, Alderwoman Taylor, your uh, suggestion about coming back uh, to the community later this month to talk about this overall um, consolidated plan as well as the housing component within that is a fine suggestion. Would be delighted to be to be front and center on that. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Cox, did you want to um, to address the question about the public participation? Oops. Obviously, you know, um, I I feel that um, all of the parties have to be comfortable with moving this forward. Um, uh, I, think the, um, I think the planning department and the housing department have, pretty, have worked pretty tirelessly. I think the alderman has been um, a part of that to reach as many people as we possibly can uh, in the forums that we've been given. And I attended uh, the open house where these were debated and you can see some images on the screen from that open house. Uh, there were hundreds of people uh, who came out and I have to say the vast majority of them were um, excited by what they saw reflected in the consolidated plan and were given, giving us their support to move forward. That's the only reason why we felt comfortable bringing it to the plan commission. Um, I think that Alderman Taylor is suggesting that she wants more uh, and she's willing to use her forums to get more input. Um, I simply think though, um, we have to give ourselves a time frame. Um, and if she feels comfortable that if we hold a forum uh, and virtually, and we've seen, you know, we've seen hundreds of people participate in the virtual forums, even during this uh, COVID, um, you know, uh, crisis, uh, that we can bring this back uh, in the May Plan Commission uh, and uh, actually take action on the plan. Um, because I, I do think that uh, it is really just a guiding uh, document, it's a framework. Uh, we really need uh, the plan commission to adopt it so that officially we can say this is what should be guiding 
uh, our decisions and developers' decisions and communities' decisions moving forward. If, Al if Alderman Taylor feels comfortable um, that having uh, a, a one more opportunity to engage people uh, will allow uh, us to bring this back for a vote in, in May, I feel very comfortable with that. And I, I'd like her to um, um, give us some assurance uh, that um, if we engage, as she is asking us to engage, uh, that we can bring this back to the plan, uh, plan commission for a vote in May. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Alderwoman, I'm gonna go to you next. I wanna just highlight a couple of points here. One is I wanna really thank uh, Commissioners Burnett and Osterman for the highlighting um, the value of a plan as, a, as this consensus document, as a vision, as something that allows, uh, allows a guideline. Um, um, and so I'm, I, I, I say that because I don't ever want us just to, to refer to a plan just as, a, as just a plan. Um, and so I think, uh, I think the, the idea of the importance of a plan for a community to help guide policymakers as well as the community itself for, for moving forward, I think is, is an important part of what has been said here this morning. Secondly, and this is, for, this is a general comment, uh, perhaps specific to, uh, to, to anything that may or may not have happened with DPD, it's more of a general, it's intended more of as a general comment. Um, and this I suppose has to do with my own planning background, but I think when we talk about about um, 100 people, for example, or any number of people who may attend a meeting, the question or the litmus test then becomes not only did they, did they attend, um, but did what they have to say get incorporated into the document? Um, so I think that to the, uh, I, I dare say that much of what got said did in fact get incorporated. I think what we would want if we were to defer this until the May meeting is we'd wanna make sure that whatever ideas got brought forward that they were in fact incorporate to the extent that it was um, um, that it was um, possible and feasible. Um, okay, so that being said, Alderwoman, um, if we were to uh, delay this to defer this until the um, until the main meeting, uh, would that give you uh, the time that you need to uh, and to engage more with some of the, the and through the processes that you've determined? Um, and um, uh, and uh, allow us to be able to move this this forward so that then the community has this has this document as well as uh, we ourselves and as other policymakers have this document. Elder woman. I'm trying to unmute you. Do I get can I get the uh, tech support? It's not unmuting. There you go. Nope. There you go. Nope. Can you hear me? Now we can, yes, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. This, I'm on my iPad, it's new. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I just want to say that I, I don't go unnoticed about the hard work that both the Housing Commission and DPD is doing. If we get this wrong, gentrification happens all over again. That's my fear and that's my plan. And that's the reason why I don't want this to be rushed. Um, I don't take for granted people's hard work because I know you all, despite not being able to work, um, have been working very hard at this. And myself and my community are appreciative of this. But as I've lived, I'm not talking about something that I think, I ain't talking about something that I heard or something that I read. My lived experience tells me if this goes wrong, we displace the very people who deserve to have this investment. And that's what I'm not going to do while I'm sitting in this seat. And so I would appreciate that we hold on to this. We do another meeting and then try to go back to this. That is, that is what I'm asking for in this seat. Let's remember, I'm elected to represent my people and protect them at all costs. And I'm gonna do that. And that doesn't always mean that I'm, a, I'm never gonna go along to get along. And I know nobody expects that from me. And I know people expect me to tell my truth. And my truth is that right now, we can't move this until we have another couple of conversations. And that's, that's all that I could ask. And I'm gonna stop there. I got another call to get on, but I thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. And please know that I'm not speaking from a place of, I think I know, I'm speaking of places I'm willing to learn. And I also want my community to learn because part of the problem is when I'm out of this seat, 
my community doesn't know the plan. They don't know what rights they have. They don't know what role they play. And I'm not gonna see that happen on my watch. Um, Alder Woman, before you leave, if, uh, if first of all, I wanna thank you for thanking uh, the hard work that's been put into this. Uh, and thank you for acknowledging that. But I wanna ask you, um, if we were to um, defer this, um, would you be able would uh, would you be able to work with uh, staff and have various constituents work with staff so we can uh, by the, the main of course okay there's no doubt in my mind of course I'm I haven't stopped working my, my I'm at the office right now my cell phone rings to me. Oh, no I know you're right working here. I mean specifically, yep. that's specifically oh of course I'm, most yeah, definitely no, I mean, and I mean by the main meeting I guess is what I'm really yeah listening. actually I want to set up a call with DPD um, and the housing department so we, we could have some conversations because there are some things that we just need to we need to agree to disagree on and then figure out how we move on. Okay. I don't think we've had that opportunity since this has happened. Okay, and I also want to know for the record, Mr. Zaroff has, uh, I want to acknowledge your hard work on this and um, um, as we always say, it's, you know, it's, it's not personal, it's how we get the best, you know, the best job done here. Um, so um, before I asked for a deferral, I, I failed to mention earlier, right when I first, at least I think I did, uh, when I first, uh, when we first went into this, um, this discussion here on this item, that both commissioners uh, uh, Viegas and Grossman had joined us. So that was way back, quite a while back ago, but just in case I, I didn't say it then, I don't think I did, I wanna make sure that I said that for the record. Okay, so now, um, uh, I uh, uh, Commissioner Shaw, you'll correct me if I'm not doing this right, but I want to uh, ask then for a motion, uh, any a motion to defer. Well, the I have a point of clarification, please. Please. It's, I, well, I want to make sure that uh, that Alderman uh, Taylor knows that the request is to for the May twenty first meeting. Is she comfortable with that? I didn't hear that that timeline no. schedule. No. That is the question I asked you, and you said yes. But so you're saying now that you need more time? No, I need. I will. I want to have a meeting with my community before this. This goes anywhere is what I'm asking. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying that, Commissioner Tony, because I I took her answer to me as to, some to be yes. There. Uh, 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 hold on. Hold on. Um, all right. So go ahead, Commissioner Cox. No, Madam Chair, uh, and and Alderman Taylor. Um, I can commit to you uh, here that we will assist you in organizing a meeting um, with broad participation um, before May 21st. And I'm talking about on the heels of, you know, a meeting that was recently done by your colleague, Alderman King, that was um, jointly organized with planning, the planning department, and she reached hundreds of people. Okay in using this very same format and we certainly can commit to you when is the the city council meeting is when is it may 20th yes you know is there a way to do this so we don't have to say that it absolutely has to be may 21st can we say we're you know say that we're shooting for that but we're not determining that it's coming back to 20 let's shoot for that i'll shoot for that i'll okay. make the commitment to shoot for that okay all right that. We appreciate that. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Um, and uh, and I and uh, I'm sure that you'll work very closely to make sure that that the that the range of people that the older woman wants at that meeting is notified and has access to be present. Absolutely. Okay. Can I get a motion then to defer this item? Move to defer. Uh, I'm sorry. Who was that? Alderman Waggis back, or Commissioner oh, Waggis back, moved. Thank you, Commissioner. And then uh, second by Alderman Tunney. And seconded by Alderman Tunney. Okay, so I think I have to do a roll call vote on this. So let me do that. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Brumfeld has uh, has um, recused himself from this item. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Can we get everybody unmuted while I do the roll call? Commissioner Grossman. Yes. Commissioner Kelly. Oh, I'm sorry, he's not here. 
Commissioner Lightfoot is not here. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. yes. Commissioner Novada. Yes. Commissioner Osterman. Yes. Commissioner Peterson is not here. Commissioner uh, Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Spazado is not here. Commissioner Tunney. Is yes. Commissioner Viegas. Yes. And Commissioner Vegas. Okay, thank you yes. very much. The motion passes to defer with a goal of a mark. Thank you all. Mr. Narloff, or Zaroff rather, thank you so much for your hard work on this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, Commissioner Cox, thank you. We, um, we do uh, what we can to make this as good a product as possible so that we end up having that uh, those goals that were stated earlier by, by Commissioner slash Alderman. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go to the next agenda item. We're a little behind schedule right now for those of you who are listening in. Um, the next item on the agenda is a proposed amendment to institutional plan development 1184 submitted by DePaul College Prep Foundation for the property generally located at 3246-3360 North Campbell Avenue, which is also 2500-2546 West Melrose Street uh, to 3237-3429 North Rockwell Street to consolidate sub areas A and B and to incorporate new property into the boundaries of institutional plan development number 1184. The site to be incorporated into plan development number 1184 is proposed to be rezoned from RS-2 residential single unit detached house district to C1-1 neighborhood commercial district and then to institutional plan development number 1184 as amended to allow for the phased development of new campus facilities. The subject property is in the 47th Ward. Mike Penichnak will provide the context overview and the applicants will present their proposal. Um, so the presentation. Can, um, am I unmuted and is my presentation shared? Yes. May I confirm that? Thank you. Okay, so um, good morning, uh, members of the uh, commission. Uh, today, I am here with a team from uh, the DePaul College Prep Foundation uh, to present a proposed amendment to institutional plan development 1184. Do we know why I'm not able, oh, there we go. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, P, uh, PD 1184 is located in the North Center community area, uh, which has a population of approximately 35,789 people. Among that uh, group, 25% are under the age of 19 and that cohort has increased by 5% since uh, 2010. Um, only 39% uh, of households have multiple vehicles and approximately half of the uh, population uh, primarily uh, walks, bikes, or uses public transit. Institutional land uses such as this uh, currently comprise about 5 6% of uh, the North Center community area. This uh, PD is currently in the uh, 47th Ward. And we do have a letter of support from Alderman uh, Matt Martin. So um, PD uh, 1184 was originally established for uh, DeVry University in 2011. Um, since then, uh, DeVry uh, has sold this property to the uh, DePaul College Prep Foundation. Um, so they have been, and they will go more into their outreach um, later in the presentation. Uh, but they did an open house before they filed the application. They've done various open houses and other community outreach meetings. Um, so this is an aerial of what the PD will look like when amended. Uh, you can see its proximity to the uh, 49 bus route and Express 49 bus route, which runs from uh, West Berwyn in the north to West 79th Street to the south. The project 
site. Um, you can see the adjacent uses uh, is to the east of Clark Park, to the south of Lane Tech, another institutional user, uh, to the west of a commercial shopping district, and to the north of the Chicago of a Chicago Police Department headquarters, uh, Who Friendly's headquarters, and a residential building. And if I here is another aerial. Um, I believe that this is where I pass it off to uh, Liz Butler with uh, DePaul College Prep Foundation. Good morning. Am I am I visible and unmuted? You are uh, unmuted, uh, but you are, I don't see any video. But we do Noah and tech support. We'll stay on the plans, Liz. You can go ahead and speak. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Liz Butler from the law firm of DLA Piper. And I, along with my colleague, Rich Clowder, represent the applicant for this matter, DePaul College Prep Foundation. Um, is there any video for me, Noah? Can you go to the bottom? If, 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 uh, is your um, little icon, video icon, is there a red line to it or is a red line gone? Just you to might let have me promote to... her to panelist. Ah, uh, okay. Am I visible now? Okay, here we go. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, tech support. So again, it's good to be here with you all today. My name is Liz Butler from DLA Piper. Um, I'm joined today with uh, by representatives of DePaul, Mary Dempsey, the president of DePaul, Ronald Mitchell and Rachel Cooper of Moody Nolan, the project architect, Jen Draper of Terra Engineering, who are the civil engineer and landscape architect for the project. Uh, Peter Hunt of Bully and Andrews, the general contractor for the project. Um, I just want to take a pause here to confirm that our presenters are going to be promoted to panelist status so that they can um, make their respective presentations. So Mary, Ronald, and I will be the primary presenters. Rich, Jen, and Peter will be available to answer any questions that arise at the conclusion of our presentation. Um, tech support or NOAA, will, will they be promoted as panelists? So we're working on that. Okay. Um, I, I'll continue with my presentation while, while you guys work on that. Uh, DePaul College Prep is a high performing nonprofit co educational college prep high school that serves grades nine through 12. It currently operates at 3633 North California Avenue. Um, and in response to their rapidly growing enrollment, DePaul College Prep acquired the subject property, which is an approximately 17 acre campus that includes modern school buildings located um, on this site context plan that you can see 3300 North Campbell. DePaul intends to move its operations to the new campus starting this summer in July of 2020. And uh, the uh, requested amendment to the plan development will allow DePaul to upgrade and enhance the campus with modern facilities, um, which we will detail in our presentation. If I could um, have you go to the next slide, please, Mike, Michael. This next slide or this next? Yes, perfect. So I would like to invite DePaul's president, Mary Dempsey, to say a few, I'm sorry, if we could go back to the, the collage, DePaul slide. Thank you. So I'd like to um, turn the presentation over to Mary to say a few words about uh, DePaul's mission and their objectives with this project. Mary, are you, have you been promoted? Perfect. I, yeah. Can everyone hear me? 
Great, good, thank you. Good morning, my name is Mary Dempsey and I'm president of DePaul College Prep Foundation. I want to thank Madam Chairman and the commissioners for inviting me to speak uh, this morning. And I wanna thank the planning staff and 47th Ward Alderman Matt Martin for their work with us on this project. Uh, DePaul College Prep is a co-ed Catholic high school which welcomes students and families of all faiths. Our current enrollment is 530 students. Our religious sponsors are the Vincentian Order of Priests who also sponsor DePaul University. Our core values are faith, respect, excellence, and service. And in that light, last year, our students provided more than 16,000 hours of service in Chicago, uh, in rural parts of this country, and in Central America. DePaul Prep operates in academic partnership with DePaul University. Our students and faculty have access to the academic, professional development, research, and curricular resources of the university. However, DePaul Prep is financially independent of both DePaul University and the Archdiocese of Chicago, which means we are responsible for raising our own operating dollars through tuition and fundraising. DePaul Prep offers college prep, advanced placement, honors and international baccalaureate classes on our campus, and we offer dual enrollment classes with DePaul University on the DePaul University campus. This year, 98% of our students were accepted to four-year colleges and universities. 99% of our students live in the city of Chicago across 49 zip codes, and they come to us from more than 125 parochial and public elementary schools. Our students are Catholic, other Christian denominations, Jewish, Muslim, and Orthodox. Nearly 50% are students of color, and approximately 46% receive financial assistance from us to attend the call prep. Since our founding in 2014, we have rented the school buildings at 3633 North California, which were built in 1962 and previously occupied by Gordon Tech High School. Those facilities are owned by the Resurrection Priests and Brothers who continue to maintain their residence on the site. As I mentioned earlier, this year our enrollment is 530 students, but on the strength of our academic accomplishments, our enrollment has increased dramatically each year since 2014. We expect to exceed an enrollment of 670 students for the 2020-2021 school year, which will begin this August. To accommodate our growing enrollment and to fully meet the 21st century teaching and learning needs of our faculty and students with ADA compliant, energy efficient buildings, modern science labs, classroom technology, air conditioning, modern and safe dining facilities, a performance space, a library, a chapel, and athletic facilities to support the needs of all of our student athletes. We made the decision to acquire this new campus and modern school buildings on Campbell. The majority of our students take public transportation. Some come on our own buses, many walk or bicycle to school. That will not change with the new campus as we are moving just across the river and only a quarter mile south of the location we currently rent at Gordon Tech. We are very excited to bring this project to the 47th Ward. I wanna thank the Department of Planning and Development staff, the Department of Transportation's commissioner and staff, the members of the plan commission and Alderman Matt Martin and his staff for the leadership they have exhibited in advancing this important project. I wanna thank you all for helping us to secure our future. And now I'll return this presentation back to Liz Butler. Thank you, Mary. Um, next slide, please. So some of my talking points about this slide over, overlap with Michael's presentation. So I'll run through them um, quickly so we can get to some of the images of the um, beautiful proposed new building. The approximately 17 acre campus is surrounded uh, by a mixture of public open space, recreational, educational, and commercial uses, as you'll see on this uh, existing zoning and land use context map. Carrywood Field and Lane Tech College Prep are uh, immediately to the north of the subject property. And as Michael 
uh, said the property is currently zoned as part of institutional plan development number 1184, which was originally established in 2011 to allow for DeVry's development of the existing campus. Um, a parking lot at the north of the campus is owned by DePaul and is currently zoned RS2. In order to bring it into the PD um, to serve as additional parking for the school, DePaul is proposing to rezone this parking lot to the C11 and then to incorporate that parcel into the boundaries of the planned development. Next uh, slide, please. I do wanna take a, a pause for a moment to make sure that Ronald Mitchell has been promoted to panelist. Um, Noah or tech support. Yes, the whole team is in. Is he assigned another? Thank you. Um, shown on this slide are the existing and proposed site plans. So the existing campus is on the left and the proposed site plan is on the right. You'll see that the campus is currently improved with two existing academic buildings, the West Wing and the East Wing. These buildings are currently occupied by tenants who uh, intend to ramp down their use of the space um, while DePaul transitions into the campus over the next two academic years. On the right, you'll see the northwest of the campus with the proposed two-story athletic building. Uh, our project architect will discuss the building design in greater detail momentarily. Next slide, please. Thank you. Here you'll see on the left, the overall site plan for the campus. And then on the right is an enhanced view of the athletic turf field. So today the campus provides 610 vehicular parking spaces, which is a relatively high parking count that made sense when the former use of the property was for adult education, where many adults were arriving at the campus by their own private um, personal vehicles. The proposed development will replace a portion of the surface parking lot at the north of the campus with this installation of an athletic field at the northeast of the site. That will result in a reduction of the overall parking count from 610 spaces to 413, which is more than um, sufficient to accommodate students and faculty of um, DePaul. For reference, DePaul's current campus only has about 100 parking spaces, so this will um, accommodate the entire student body and visitors. The reduction in the overall parking count um, will be coupled with increase in landscape and permeable area, which will soften the campus and generate more of an inviting and pedestrian-oriented campus. Uh, as Michael noted, this is a this property is well served by public transit. It's in fact a transit served location um, as a result of its proximity to the Western Avenue CTA bus line corridor roadway segment. And bicycle racks will be provided throughout the site. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn the presentation over to Renald Mitchell of Moody Nolan, the project architect to run through the proposed improvements in greater detail. Ronald? Yeah, thank you, Liz. And um, uh, Madam Chair, um, to the commissioners, to the distinguished members of the city council, um, good morning again. And, and I pray and trust that each of you and those you cherish are remaining well and safe you know, during this pandemic. Um, very quickly, as a matter of overview, the next um, series of slides that I'll walk you through you really start to focus in on um, five key planning and design um, elements that, that we'd like to share with you. Um, one, um, how we've taken measures to improve the pedestrian experience. Um, two, the vertical improvements that we're you're proposing um, to the existing. Um, three, um, how we've treated circulation and open space. Four, uh, materiality and design context. And then lastly, you know, our overview of our strategies for addressing sustainability. So starting at the image that's um, currently displayed, um, this actually is at um, North Campbell Street and this would serve as the primarily both vehicular and pedestrian access points um, for the site. 
Um, you'll also note that inset into the upper right hand corner are, is an existing photo just providing you a sense, a, uh, sense of existing context relative to how we're uh, our strategies for trying to improve the, um, the experience. And so you're starting here, you, you enter the site um, with um, your know, vehicular access, also a, a walkway for pedestrians, but we provide it as a traffic calming measure, um, a green um, a median um, with um, trees and vegetation. So you can move on to the next slide, please, Michael. Alrighty, as you get into the campus, now you can see um, to your right, um, the existing um, building where we have situated the front door um, to the, um, the new high school. And you can also see some of the landscape improvements that we've made. Um, the predominant feature shown here um, is actually um, an area that we're referring to as Alumni Plaza. Um, you can see that you know, immediately adjacent to um, some of the continental crosswalks, um, you know, nice vegetation and benches for, for you know, students and, and people to gather. Um, this is also an opportunity for um, students and alumni to you know, memorialize their legacy with the, um, with the school um, in the way of um, you know, inscribed pavers. But immediately um, adjacent to the building, there are also um, you know, landscaped areas with um, you know, park seating and benching, you know, just to, again, to improve the, the student um, and pedestrian experience. Next slide, please. Alrighty, as you come around, this is the view corridor looking back towards the existing building. Um, immediately to the right, um, you have a portion or a segment of one of the vertical improvements that we'll go into a little bit more detail later on. Um, and to the left, um, likewise, um, you have an athletic field with bleachers and, and some um, amenity spaces, which we'll also touch on in more detail um, later in the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, and then as you come to the western edge along Melrose, um, again, you see the uh, full edition of the athletics annex um, in full display. Um, and so this would be the secondary you know, point of ingress and egress for vehicles um, to the site. Um, next slide, please. Alrighty, and so this represents the finished state um, of the um, full campus um, post development. And so you see in the foreground, um, the athletic field with the aforementioned bleachers, um, you can get a sense of, of the grandeur of the approach through the um, vehicle and pedestrian walkway as you approach the main entrance to the school. You can also see how the new athletics annex, which is more so in the foreground and to the right on your screen, how it gently and um, you know, graciously abuts the existing building. Um, this was something that we were really sensitive to as um, planners and designers to try to make sure that you know, from a massing perspective, as well as from a materiality perspective, the new addition um, well complemented, you know, that of the existing construction in scale and proportion. Um, next slide, please. Alrighty, so here we'll spend a, a few seconds talking about the overall site plan just to give you full orientation. So um, Campbell Street um, to the east or to um, the right of the screen, um, Melrose to the left, and to the south, because actually Melrose kind of bends um, as in, bends into Rockwell, um, and then Rockwell heads on up to towards Addison um, Road. Um, Liz mentioned earlier that the property abuts Carrywood Field as well as Lane Tech College Prep High School. Um, and so what we did from a planning strategy was given the presence of Carrywood Field and Lane Stadium, which is not shown here, but would be immediately north of that skinny sliver of parking that you see to the north of the site, um, we thought it was appropriate to situate the athletic field and the stadium to that area, almost create, creating a bit of an athletics you know, vista or a quad. And also the athletic annex um, to the building, which is shade, shaded in gray, um, is also um, positioned um, to the north end of the building. And so you see you know, the existing east and west buildings, um, which will be the subject of interior you know, improvements and modifications um, to enhance student experience. Um, that work, um, some of which has already been permitted for the west building and is underway. Um, the east building represents future flex space, um, accommodating future um, student enrollment growth um, for the institution. Next slide, please. 
All righty, so here you start to get an, an overview of the overall floor plan. Again, I won't go into exhaustive detail, but you can see the athletic annex depicted to the north end of this or the upper part of the slide featuring a gymnasium, a competition gymnasium that will seat about 1600 um, you know, patrons. Um, that space also includes a, um, an indoor running oval or a track for, for all season round training for student athletes. Um, and it's also features a natatorium, six lane, um, 25 meter competitive natatorium. Um, the school will be able to host IHSA level events, you know, as well as, you know, the planning and the design of the space also allows for off hours use and possibly community rec um, type uses. Um, and then various support spaces, locker rooms, offices, weight training facilities and the like. Um, within the existing buildings, um, we're making surgical revisions and um, modifications again to, to accommodate um, the specific needs for DePaul College Prep. And as I mentioned earlier, the West Building, which um, is joined um, you know, via large expanse of atrium you know, to the East Building, um, or pardon, I reversed that East Building, which is a joint to the West Building, will again be the subject of um, future growth and expansion. Next slide, please. All right, you move up to the second floor, you can actually see the, um, the um, indoor running oval, um, you know, better depicted here. Um, the natatorium also features an observation deck, so um, it can hold about a couple of hundred patrons, you know, for competitive events. Um, and also another feature is behind or immediately south of the natatorium and, and west of the um, gymnasium and, and running oval, um, we've provided for a green roof. Um, this roof, um, vegetative roof, will be in support of the school's um, academic um, botany program, which is immediately adjacent to that green roof um, in plan in the existing building. Um, next slide, please. Alrighty, from here, the next series of slides starts to, to depict both existing and new um, facades you know, for the school. And so what you're seeing here um, is all existing construction um, with the exception of the, um, the DePaul you know, College Prep um, logo that will you know, situate adjacent to um, one of the, the existing entrances in the building, which we're designating as the main entrance. Next slide, please. Um, here, moving around to the uh, south and west. Again, this is all existing construction um, depicted. Um, next slide, please. All right, moving around to the east. Um, again, all existing construction depicted. Um, and I was uh, remiss to mention um, the existing facade material is comprised of composite metal panels, um, two-tone in, in color. So the primary color is a your know, metallic um, off-white silverish you know, tone. The darker tone is like a charcoal or gunmetal you know, um, type color. Um, this is important because you'll see as we transition to the next series of images that depict some of the new construction, how we've tried to contextualize um, through the selection of new materials, you know, the colors and tones that are prevalent in the existing construction. Next slide, please. All right, and so again, the last of the existing um, elevations um, west. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, partial um, existing um, north, because there are a number of sides, as you can see, in plan to this building. Um, next slide, please. And also existing portion to the south. Next slide, please. Um, existing portion to the east. This happens to be the east building, by the way, that's being depicted in these slides. Um, next slide, please. And then last, um, the west elevation of the existing east building, um, you can see the void out where you where the two buildings, east and west, physically abut um, one another. Next slide, please. All righty, so now we start to transition into some of the new construction. And so you know, what you're seeing depicted here um, is the north elevation um, to the left of the screen um, would be the gymnasium and um, running oval. Um, with a secondary entrance um, for athletic events. We were very intentional in, in the planning of this such that the school could be zoned in such a way that if there were athletic events occurring after hours, after school hours or after business hours, um, the school could host such events and, and not have to open up the entirety of the building. Um, and then immediately to the right um, side of the image is the um, natatorium that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. All right, coming around the south, um, you, you start to see 
you know, a side of the, um, the natatorium space. Um, you can also see, you know, the introduction of, of storefront and, and, you know, um, glazing systems, which again are very complementary to the existing construction. Um, this is also the area between the um, natatorium and the existing building um, where you start to see the, um, the green roof um, occur. Um, next slide, please. All right, coming around to the east, um, this was that view. Um, if we harken back to earlier slides where I was demonstrating pedestrian context, this would be that facade along that view corridor that separates the gymnasium building from the turf field and athletic um, stadium. Um, next slide, please. All right, and then coming about to the west, um, this would be your, your westward head on um, your elevation um, view. Um, next slide, please. All righty, so transitioning into just kind of circulation and how we, we treated open space. So we started off with a general intent to promote you know, pedestrian, cyclist, and, and vehicular circulation and safety um, by clearly demarking you know, access points and paths. And, and, and you know, frankly, you know, even by the, through the reduction of um, overall parking counts on the site. And so you see in the thumbnail image to the right of the slide, um, the various um, vehicular you know, access points and pedestrian access points for the building. So as I mentioned earlier, the main front door will be to the north um, along that new drive that we created separating the Alumni Plaza and the stadium you know, from the existing West building. And so um, you come in and you have the ability to, to traverse the site in a generally east-west direction, you know, bending north for a bit you know, in that view corridor that I mentioned previously. Um, and you can discharge to the west or con conversely, you know, entering from the west and discharging from um, towards the east. Um, important to note, um, existing loading dock um, in the west building um, remains active and will still serve as the primary loading and access point for goods and materials. Um, there's also an existing parking lot to the south um, that is generally remaining you know, undisturbed um, with the exception of restriping and, and some enhanced landscape improvements along its edge you know, along Rockwell and Melrose. Um, but that parking area will primarily serve as overflow parking. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the primary access points are to the north of the building and the primary parking usage for you know, faculty, staff and visitors will be to the north. Um, we see that south parking lot as overflow, you know, primarily being used for when there are athletic events uh, being hosted by the school. Next slide, please. Um, I don't know if I'm frozen. Um, can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Uh, this the slide I have on my screen says uh, general intent. Um, I've noticed a brief lag time between my clicking of the next slide and uh, your and uh, Liz's, I guess it popping up on your screen. So I have 17-8-0909A general intent on my screen. Is that what you have? Uh, it is now. So, so okay. yeah, th thank you. Thank you for my that. Apologies. No, no, no. My apologies for the, for the lag. And so you're continuing on just talking a bit about, you know, open, open spaces. So you, know, again, I, I teased some of those things earlier. We, we really placed a heavy emphasis on, you know, improving the pedestrian experience. You'll recall from, you know, the existing state, you know, of the building that, you know, the entirety of the north and south ends of the building, you know, are, are comprised by parking. Um, some nearly 700, you know, parking spaces in aggregate. Um, we've reduced that number to about 415 or so. Um, and, and that's primarily driven by the introduction of the, um, the athletic field, but also some of the gracious landscape gestures that we introduced, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the plazas, you know, and, and many of the outdoor amenities and spaces that were introduced to soften that experience, as well as to try to, to, try to quiet your know, vehicular traffic um, traversing the site. So we see this as a, a huge improvement, you know, both in safety and in experience for, for the users. Um, next slide, please. All right, from a materiality standpoint, I touched upon earlier the existing building being comprised of composite metal panel, um, uh, tonal in nature. And, and so we've kept, you know, by and large with that vernacular for the new addition, 
Um, we, in our curtain wall and in our glazing systems, we are introducing some frit and some texture um, to try to create, you know, some varying and differing tones to distinguish old from new, but nonetheless, you know, it's very much in keeping with the existing design vernacular. Um, you know, metal panel, composite metal panel is the predominant skin, but in select locations, we've also introduced, you know, um, some masonry as well, you know, just for, you know, durability, mainly at kind of the, the base of, of the um, gymnasium building, just providing for grounding, you know, of sorts for the building. And again, tones that are very complementary to the existing um, construction. Next slide, please. All righty, from a sustainability standpoint, we will um, comply with um, the city of Chicago's um, sustainability um, policy. Um, and, and, we're, and basically that requires a, a 100 point, you know, meeting a 100 point threshold or exceeding um, our strategy for doing so. Um, the project, um, the new project, the new building will pursue LEED Silver um, certification. Um, that gets you most of the way there, you know, candidly by itself, but we've also identified a number of other, you know, uh, sustainable strategies that will incorporate, um, you know, in including, you know, you know, basically the energy code, um, enhanced natural landscape, um, you know, water reduction, you know, all of which combined will, will get us or exceed, you know, the um, point threshold required. Um, next slide, please. From a stormwater management perspective, a couple of things um, important to note. Um, one, um, not shown in plan, but, but existing part of the existing improvements and that would be immediately east of the existing east building. You'll see in the thumbnail image to the right, you know, kind of a landscaped buffered green or lawn area. That's actually a stormwater detention, you know, area. And so, you know, that's capturing your know, rainwater, um, you know, naturally in that zone. But to enhance that, we've also introduced, um, you know, HPDE, you know, vaults beneath the football field. You can see those highlighted and dashed um, in the you know, magenta or blue colored you know, tone with the white um, outline, um, you know, again, along the football field. Um, also important to note that the remainder of the turf field is also, um, in, um, you know, will allow for you know, you know, water you know, and stormwater percolation um, and eventual discharge um, at a controlled rate you know, to um, the city um, uh, municipal system. Next slide, please. All righty, so at this point, I'm gonna hand the, um, the presentation and the controls back to um, council, to Liz Butler, um, and she'll talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the project's outreach efforts and, and you know, bring us to a close. So Liz, go right ahead. Thank you, Rinald, again, for the record, uh, I'm Liz Butler from DLA Piper. This slide covers the project timeline and community outreach and um, I know that we're running a little bit over on time, so I will make my remarks brief. Uh, the most recent community meeting was held on March 12th. It was held in person and participants were invited to view and join the meeting remotely. Um, all participants expressed broad support and, and enthusiasm for DePaul's move to uh, the new campus. One item I'd like to highlight in the way of design changes to the plan um, in response to a request from, uh, from DPD and CDOT, the applicant has agreed to um, offsite improvements uh, to enhance the pedestrian realm in the way of a new ADA compliant crosswalk across um, Rockwell. And we'll be um, refreshing all of the um, uh, crosswalks that are in proximity to the uh, to the campus. Next slide, please. Thank you. Lillian Andrews is the general contractor for the project. Um, DePaul is committed to equitable participation in hiring for this project and has established a goal of 26% MBE and 6% WBE contract participation along with 50% city residency hiring. I'm happy to uh, go through these uh, benefits, uh, community benefits quickly um, at, at, uh, um, if there are any questions. Um, but at this time, I will turn it back over to DPD staff to turn to, to close the presentation out. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, this is Michael Penisnack, Department of Planning and Development. Uh, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the material submitted by the applicant and concluded this is appropriate uh, development for the following reasons. The amendment would ensure continued institutional use on the site and would encourage the use of transit. And finally, the proposal is governed and complies with all provisions of the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. Um, I would encourage uh, people uh, to please refer to my staff report for further details on this project and the plans identified here today. Uh, based on the foregoing, the Department of Planning and Development recommends that this application to amend institutional plan development 1184 be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards. Um, thank you uh, for allowing us to present, and I believe this would be the uh, questions uh, portion of our presentation. Do the, do the commissioners have any questions of the staff or the applicant? Uh, Commissioner Biagi, you will be unmuted by staff, by tech support here in a second. There you go. Hello? Great. Okay. Um, uh, I just wanted to clarify for the record that the ADA improvements are on Campbell, uh, not Rockwell. And I do want to add uh, my appreciation for the collaboration with DePaul on making those things possible. So we're, we're looking forward to a, a safe and, and well circulated campus. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Osterman, you're unmuted. Oh, you just got remuted. You're unmuted again. Thank you. Um, I want to lend my support to the plan, um, both as an alumni of Gordon Tech back in the day and as a parent of a student. Um, the leadership under Mary Dempsey at the school has really expanded the school. The plan before you today, I think, is going to really enhance their ability to attract students and grow and provide a great educational opportunity for um, more students on, throughout the city of Chicago that will come there. So. Um, and it's a great use of space that is, I think, right now um, not utilized to its best ability. I think they've really found a creative way to maximize it, um, which I think will have a greater impact on the entire community. Um, and in chatting with Alderman Martin, he is in support. So um, just wanted to lend my support. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Wagespach. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, can you hear me there? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I also want to express my support for this project. Um, I've spoken to Roscoe Village Neighbors, which um, is the community group to the east there that I know Alderman Martin has worked with, and they uh, show their support for this as well. Um, I was just, just one question on the, um, as you go northbound on Rockwell, um, I heard that you were going to refresh the crosswalks there for the west side of the street where we have the boathouse. And um, was there any movement of the bus stop as well there? Or was, was that looked at right at the uh, kind of offset or conflicting points there? So I would like to direct that question to the development team. This is Liz. I can um, take that question. Thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Biagi. I misspoke when I said that the crosswalk would be installed at Rockwell. In fact, it will be installed at the main, the entrance to the main campus at North Campbell Avenue. Um, we did not have any uh, discussions with CDOT or CTA regarding relocating the, the bus stop on Rockwell. Okay, I was just curious because it's uh, it's heavily trafficked there with people coming out of the boathouse, um, especially kind of post school hours when you have a lot of people going up to um, the Chicago fire pitch as well. So I was just curious if there anybody had looked at that, but um, maybe just keep an eye on it uh, for future reference. But I, I think it's a great project otherwise. And I thank you guys for bringing it. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner uh, Burnett. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to also uh, take this opportunity to commend uh, this plan. I think the architecture and the plan was very well thought out. Uh, I'd like to commend Mary Dempsey for all her work. 
been helping young people, uh, not just on this, but over the years, uh, all over the place. I think that's fantastic. Thank you for your philanthropic uh, service to our city. Uh, just to have one question. Uh, Bull and Andrews is a, a company that I've worked with in my ward uh, over the years. Uh, matter of fact, they've done some work for the Salvation Army. Uh, and uh, when they did work in my ward, they, they were very uh, welcoming to work with minority contractors. Uh, generally, they uh, potentially joint venture with some uh, some minority contractors, African American in particular. I wanted to know uh, were they going to do that with this project? This is Peter with Bowling Andrew. I can speak to that. Can you guys hear me? Can, yeah, but can yeah. you repeat your name again so make sure that the um, the our clerk our clerk can get it correct. Peter Kuhn, K U H N, with Bowling Andrews. Our intent right now is not to joint venture. Um, we this is actually a design build project, and we've we've teamed up with uh, Moody Nolan on that project as a joint venture to achieve um, some minority um, and. WBE participation with, so we've really been teaming up with, um, from a design build standpoint with our uh, design partners on this. So we don't attend from a build standpoint, but uh, have heavily reached out to M and W uh, subcontractors to get them involved with the project as well. Do you have, do you have a follow-up question to that, Commissioner Burnett? Yeah, can you tell me who are, who are some of them? I know you usually uh, do a lot of things with, with Ujama and uh, JLL. Um, yeah. I, I some of the subs. yeah, some of the subs, um, you know, from my MEP standpoint, um, uh, Thomas Mechanical, from a plumbing standpoint, Taylor Electric, uh, Gim Electric, uh, Escarpita, um, JLL could definitely be considered from an excavation standpoint for the new athletics edition. Um, Air Design Systems is a WB company. Um, and then also through suppliers like Diamond Waste um, okay. and uh, items such as that. But we can provide an entire list if we want to follow up with that, of who we provide to reach out to and who we plan to partner with. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'd like to see that. I, I appreciate the, I appreciate your willingness in the past to, to uh, work with African-American contractors. And uh, I'm sure you're going to do a good job on this. Thank you. Commissioner Thank you. Commissioner Viegas, followed by Commissioner Tunney. Thank you, uh, um, Madam Chair. The uh, Alderman Barnett mentioned that. I, I was, that was my question. I wanted to make sure that as the uh, subconsultants, subcontractors, design, build team was reflective of the community where the work is going to be taking place at. Um, I know that on a, de on a design, so then with the design build, are you telling me that you're getting the majority of the MWBE spend just by the design side? No, it, it, it's going to be design and construction, the entire product value. Okay. From the w standpoint. I got you. Okay. And then uh, if you could provide that list of some of the firms and some of the entities you've reached out to, I'd be interested in that as well. We will follow up with that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney. Good uh, afternoon. I think at this point, um, I wanted to congratulate, uh, she'll always be my commissioner, uh, Commissioner Dempsey. Uh, for her uh, extraordinary efforts with the De DePaul College Prep. Um, my question is more on the economics of it. Uh, I see the project cost is approximately 38 million. Uh, does that include land costs? And then are there any other, uh, any other financing, TIF and otherwise involved with the project? Uh, thank, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you, Alderman Tani. Thank you for your kind words. Um, no, that-, can you, that say, is, can you state your name for the record? Please? I'm sorry, Mary Dempsey, president of DePaul College Prep. The land acquisition costs are separate and are that we're working that debt service into our operating budget. Um, so the, uh, the $38 million that you see is simply for the improvements that we are putting into the current campus. And there are no public. And there are no. I thank you. Uh, there are no TIF dollars. There are no public dollars involved in this project. Um, Mary, um, I'm surprised in the presentation you didn't have a library expose uh, because uh, of your past uh, 
knowledge and your degree from Illinois, uh, uh, Library of Science. So I know it'll be uh, utmost and most modern of facility. Um, so again, uh, you know, I know your projected enrollment is going from 580 upcoming. Um, and DeVry was a for-profit university, I believe. Uh, so I believe that this, um, and if you're, not, if you're not privy to say what the cost of buying the property from DeVry, um, I, I know you're saying you'll bake it into your financials, but um, I know you're a prodigious, prodigious fundraiser also, but this is a very, very um, handsome, and I would say <laughs> somewhat expensive project. Um, the, uh, and the fact that if DeVry was a for-profit, they were probably paying real estate taxes. And I'm assuming this property will not be paying real estate taxes. That is correct. That's more of a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, thank you, Mary Dempsey. Again, um, uh, we will, yes, that is correct. We will not be paying property taxes um, so long as um, the adjoining building is still occupied by Chamberlain, which is also a for-profit. Um, there is a real estate tax component there, which is part of our um, uh, negotiation with them, but the entire campus that we occupy will be off the tax, real estate tax rolls. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Thank so you, Chairman. Mm -hmm. You're quite welcome. So I have on uh, record, we have on record a letter from Alderman Martin uh, in support of this project. Uh, Alderman Martin was on the call earlier, um, but is not on there now, but we do have that record on file. Um, so with no additional questions from the commissioners, um, do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to institutional Plan development number 1184 to consolidate sub areas A and B and to incorporate new property into the boundaries of the institutional plan development number 1184 to allow for the phased development of new campus facilities, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Uh, so, uh, so moved move by Commissioner Shaw, seconded by Burnett. Commissioner Burnett, uh, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I will do a roll call vote. Commissioner Biagi? Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld? Yes. Commissioner Burnett? And if you can unmute everyone, tech support, or at least the commissioners for the roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Flores? Yes. Commissioner Garza? I was on a call a minute ago. Okay, Commissioner Grossman? Uh, Commissioner Light that are here. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Osterman? Yes. Commissioner Peterson is not here. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Yes. Yes. Rosado is not here. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? Yes. And Commissioner Vegas Clark? Yes. So, um, we're Chairman Kelly, Kelly is a yes. I'm back. Oh, you're back. Fantastic. All right. So, Commissioner Kelly is a yes. Thank you very much, Commissioner. So, um, I, I'm going to have a chairman's update with two items, but this now does. Oh, sorry. The motion passes. Uh, and this also concludes the public hearing portion of our agenda. And as I mentioned, uh, we do have a chairman's update with two items on it. Two very brief. Well, one is very brief and the other a little less so, but I, um, I uh, on the first item, I want to make sure to update folks, as you know, back in September when I, or when I first came on as chair of the commission, I asked staff to uh, draft up some ideas for expanding our public input and, and, and changing up the process to allow um, for more, um, more perspectives to be included in the review process. 
and uh, staff came back with something that then went out for public comment. We extended the public comment into December. And as you may know from previous updates, we had um, really, really rich, very rich response from an array of, of public folks, of folks in the public, and some, who, some of whom uh, responded uh, as coalitions with very in-depth uh, recommendations and perspectives. Uh, but it was just really rich. So I have been working with staffs. Uh, Nancy Radovich in particular has been doing a tremendous job. Uh, we have been really uh, combing the, the various perspectives that were brought to us through this process, as well as taking into account what the possibilities are and limits are of what we can do. We do know that we're laying, bringing this out in phases um, and uh, it's going well and we will get back with a fuller report at our June meeting. Um, but I did want to let people know that, that this, this is progressing. Um, and we, again, really, really, uh, we received a really, really rich array of comments and perspectives and we were combing them um, to take into account as fully as we can the various re recommendations, comments and perspectives that were shared with us. So that's item number one. Item number two, I have asked Commissioner Cox if he would present an update to us on some of what he is doing in his role as director of, of the uh, DPD, uh, Department of Planning and Development. As you know, he's been uh, leading the charge on the Invest Southwest and has been reorganizing uh, DPD. So he is gonna share with us some of what he has been doing. Thank you so much, Commissioner Cox. Uh, we, we very much appreciate this. Uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity, uh, and uh, uh, no, I think you're going to make that full screen. Yes, trying to do that now. I think it's there. Okay. There it goes. Um, so uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair and, and Commissioners. Uh, um, I uh, have been asked to um, share uh, just briefly with you some of the work uh, that we've been doing in the planning department to stand up uh, a neighborhood planning division. Um, and uh, we have uh, been fortunate to, um, um, if you just go back to this, I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, let you know uh, whether to move forward, if you don't mind. Um, part of uh, the uh, work that I had uh, when I first um, accepted the position was to try to stand up um, a planning department that was able to provide uh, proactive planning and design services to every square mile of the city. Uh, and we um, went about a process um, of trying to create um, seven uh, regional districts that you see exhibited here um, that would allow us to have a north uh, region of the city, a northwest region of the city, a west region, a southwest, a southeast, and a far south, and a central region. Uh, and uh, my goal was to stand up a planning team, a cross-disciplinary team, that would be able to provide the full menu of planning services uh, to all uh, 77 community areas of the city. Uh, and uh, I'm happy uh, to say that we are, um, that structure is, is in place uh, and some strategic redeployment of uh, some of our seasoned planning professionals are also in place to anchor uh, those regional teams. And with the support of the city council uh, that um, approved the hiring of 10 new planners, um, Many of those planners are now in place. And so um, at, uh, at the leadership level, um, um, First Deputy Commissioner Ellen Agorski um, is uh, serving as our um, lead, um, uh, lead for the central um, uh, area. And, uh, and she has uh, a team um, headed by, um, uh, uh, Cindy, um, who is, um, has assembled with her a team of four planners. 
uh, and uh, Jim Harbin uh, has also, uh, he's a deputy uh, commissioner who is um, being lead to the other six planning uh, districts uh, that you see. Uh, and what you're seeing um, on the left-hand side of the slide are all of the planners who are now in place to provide these services. When, uh, when we are finished, uh, this division will be the, the largest planning division uh, in the planning department. Uh, so it's currently uh, 40, uh, 40 planners um, who are, have been mobilized to, to staff uh, this new division. If you can go to the next slide. Um, an important um, uh, resource that we have been able uh, to add is um, a, a new cohort of planners to join our, our seasoned uh, planners. Um, the six um, professionals that you see um, are all uh, already uh, at work. Uh, they have been distributed across the, the seven planning districts. Um, they come to us um, from the south side of Chicago, from the west side of Chicago, um, long time born and raised uh, planners uh, uh, like uh, Ethan Lassiter and Jasmine Gunn uh, and, and Sonia um, uh, uh, Eldridge. Uh, and uh, we have um, planners who are coming back uh, to Chicago after having had professional experiences uh, in other cities like Catherine Hurd. Uh, and then uh, Joshua's son, who is coming to us from um, Virginia. Uh, and then Luke Mitch, who is coming to us uh, from Boston. Uh, so it has been uh, amazing to absorb uh, these young professionals onto our team. Uh, they've hit the ground running uh, and are showing uh, their real value already, uh, only being two months uh, at best on the job. Uh, next. Uh, and, and here's the reason why uh, this is so important to us. Um, we are making a commitment to engage Chicagoans across the entire city geography and giving them access um, to planning and design services. Uh, and so this is an image from our kickoff uh, meeting uh, for Invest Southwest, um, where um, over 500 um, residents participated in one uh, in each of the four uh, kickoff meetings uh, and you see uh, Lisa Washington there um, Kate taking very careful notes uh, as to uh, what this particular citizen wants in her community um, the organization of the planning department allows us to have on the ground direct contact with residents uh, and they will um, be the point of entry for um, aldermen, uh, for community organizations, and for ordinary citizens and developers who are seeking uh, to be uh, a part of the investment in those communities. Uh, next. Um, it's also about creating uh, a, a, an atmosphere of accountability in the planning department. They will know who their planners are. They will have their email address and contact information. They will provide um, access to uh, the resources of the city of City Hall. And most importantly, I think we can all know who is accountable for what work uh, at the neighborhood level. Uh, next slide. Um, and, you know, the, the main issue for us is to demystify the planning and design process and to create a level of transparency uh, that um, citizens have long asked for. Uh, and I think we now um, are, have proposed a structure that will allow us uh, to do that. Um, and uh, uh, I think next. Slide, yeah, and uh, ultimately this um, is trying um, to make good on the promise uh, that uh, Mayor Lightfoot made 
uh, to create an equitable environment for investment across the entire city. Uh, and as um, we have all gone through this COVID crisis, um, she um, has made a commitment to double down on that commitment. Uh, it's a part of a much longer agenda uh, to fight poverty and racial inequity in this city. Uh, and part of doing that is allowing everyone to have access uh, to the tools of planning and design so that they can actually uh, control the, the future. Uh, so it's, um, I, I have to say, um, we uh, began this process of reorganizing the, the planning department before uh, the COVID-19 crisis began. And I can just say I am so thankful uh, that we put this structure in place prior to this crisis because it allows us to be on the ground in every part of this city uh, as we emerge out of the crisis. So uh, we have the good fortune of having planned well, uh, and this structure, I believe, is going to be uh, the structure that will allow us to finally uh, bring all Chicagoans forward uh, in, uh, in the development and resurgence of the city um, post, uh, post COVID. So um, uh, Chair, Chairman, this is really uh, what I um, thought to present, just this piece about the restructuring of the department. I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but um, thank you again for the opportunity to highlight um, this uh, new, new formation of the planning department. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner Cox. Um, and I think it's um, important to see the, the progress that you've made um, over the time and also how it's part of the larger the larger goal related to the poverty reduction and, and the larger goal of also involving um, more people into the planning process. So this is great. Do I have any questions or comments from any of the, um, any of the commissioners? Um, I saw a hand go up, uh, Alderman Villegas. Um, Madam Chair, thank you very much. I, I just missed the part where, um, as we were talking about South and Southwest, um, where, where is the investment in the Latino community? Um, I know that uh, um, as you're seeing the, the, what's, what's occurring with COVID, you know, obviously it hit the African-American community first, and now it's hitting the Latino community. And really that's just a, a what we're seeing is a lack of investment um, in the healthcare and access to healthcare. But we wanna make sure that we're also talking about investing uh, in some of these communities because it, it, I just don't see it right now. And so I wanted to kind of find out from uh, Commissioner Cox as to how does that plan, how does, how does, the, how does that community fit into the overall plan? So, so maybe we could put back up the slide that showed the personnel you have on the Southwest side. Um, one of the reasons um, why that might be particularly relevant, just to sort of um, point out that the demographics of the neighborhoods on the southwest side um, are very heavily Latino. Most of those neighborhoods have the largest single group um, are Latinos. So I think in keeping with the spirit uh, for which in which you're doing this, it seems you're going to want to have some Spanish speakers and some Latino faces as part of that team on the southwest. Yeah, that, Madam Chair, that's and that's something that. Um, uh, it's been it's been a concern of ours uh, as it relates to uh, not just pl the planning department but overall the city employment where the numbers are not reflective of of the population and so as and I I applaud Commissioner Cox in, in assembling this team because this is something that was much needed. You had a, a planning department that really, in my opinion, didn't venture out of the central business district, but now is looking in the community. But I think it's imperative that those folks that are in these communities and better in these communities um, reflect the population that's out there and have the ability to, to, to uh, communicate with, these, with, with, the, uh, with the residents. Um, and I, I, appreciate, um, I appreciate you uh, highlighting um, that concern because I, I share it. Uh, and uh, I came, I went into this process knowing um, how uh, the challenge it is to try to, to get the cross section of, uh, of uh, planners who um, can speak to the communities they're being asked to plan. And um, I was, um, I think we were successful in getting a very uh, a diverse group, uh, as you saw from the new planners. 
Um, I was disappointed um, that we did not have a robust response to the, the um, uh, to the call from Latino planners, uh, and I, um, I I went uh, everything from going to the um, uh, the uh, Latino um, uh, planner and architect network um, and spoke to two hundred um, people assembled there. Uh, and uh, we still uh, did not um, receive the response that I would hope for. So I have continued my search. Uh, there are four more planners uh, that we'll be looking for. And I have, um, uh, I have um, you know, uh, calls for um, planners out and active as we speak. Um, I must say that uh, probably one of our uh, one of our most talented planners in the planning department, uh, Gerardo Garcia, uh, has stepped forward and filled an important role uh, on the west side, uh, and so he has been a resource. I continue to look for uh, this diversity. I won't stop until we have it, um, because I think uh, Alderman's point is. We have very uh, robust and vibrant Latino communities. Um, they have commercial corridors. Um, they have uh, industrial uh, manufacturing zones. They have residential areas that are changing. Uh, and they, too, um, uh, are, are a part of the kind of uh, efforts to, to reinvest in, in those neighborhoods. And it's through all of the programs that we are, are utilizing, whether it be um, the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund or um, um, the housing, the housing uh, uh, efforts in the part of the Department of Housing. Um, we are very, very mindful uh, that we're talking about lifting up uh, black and brown communities on the south side and the west side. And so it is uh, embedded in every everything we do. Uh, I ask for the numbers of responses in every uh, program that we stand up, and I'm happy to share uh, some of those numbers uh, with you, uh, because ultimately we have to get them to participate in the programs that we are offering, so that then they can actually be the recipients of the resources in the end. Um, yeah, I, I would appreciate that, Commissioner. Also, if if I heard you correctly, you have four positions that are still available. That's right. If you want to send, send that over to uh, to us, uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and, and I'll challenge some of my um, colleagues uh, to put that out and, and try to help in helping diversify that workforce. Very much would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. And also maybe go back into your pool because I think we know of many Latinos that did apply um, for these positions. Um, but again, that, that Southwest section, and then I suspect that Commissioner Barnett, Burnett we may raise something similar on the West side. Um, Commissioner Burnett. Thank you. And, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, oh, you got excuse me, I'm on a conference call with the mayor at the same time. But um, um, I would be remiss, Commissioner, if I did not reiterate what myself and my colleagues have said on the West side. Uh, we don't have any African-American representation on the West side. I know Gerardo is there. Um, Lisa actually lives in my ward on the west side. Patrick used to be one of our area coordinators on the west side. I don't understand why we can't get African American on the west side. You know, I'm gonna tell you how people are in the community. When they see these kind of things, they already get suspect. And when they see new things happening, they always think that people are trying to push them out or leave them out. I think people would feel more comfortable if they saw somebody like them representing these um, proposals to change things and build them up. So it's just so, and, and, I, and I, I know that's what, um, that, that's what my colleagues have expressed to Jim uh, when we had a, a conference call with him. Um, we've expressed it to you. Uh, I think you should take that in, into consideration and maybe move some of the folks around. So if I may, um, and I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, Nora, you can go back to the new planners. Go back to the page with the new planners. I just want to uh, 
you know, underscore, and I and I hope uh, uh, Alderman uh, Burnett knows that people uh, of color come in all shades and hues. Uh, and so uh, I, I was pleased that of the six planners, uh, two are Caucasian, uh, two are Asian, uh, and two are African American. Uh, and so um, um, uh, Ethan Lassiter, who is African American, born and raised in the South Side of Chicago, uh, has joined the West team with uh, Gerardo Garcia. And it was his choice after knowing the South Side quite well, he wanted to make a contribution to the West Side. So he joined uh, um, Gerardo Garcia's team. Um, and so uh, the, I think we can continue, um, as I said, I was uh, disappointed that I did not have uh, Latino planners uh, to introduce to you today. Uh, but it sounds like we can uh, do more and I will continue uh, to do that. But as I said, we, we have to, uh, uh, we, uh, we have to acknowledge, I, all I can do is put their handsome and pretty faces up on the screen. Uh, but uh, just remind folks that uh, we come in all hues and shades, uh, but this is probably the most diverse group of planners that we've added to our team. I appreciate that, Commissioner. But Lisa live on the west side. Did she choose not to work on the west side? She lived right there in my ward on the west side. Uh, I will take this up with Lisa uh, Washington. And Lisa actually used to work for an alderman, you know, so she knows how to deal with alderman, right? I, I, I appreciate your observation and I'm gonna have a debriefing uh, with the team. Uh, it's not set in stone, uh, but we did try to uh, place them uh, according to uh, where we thought they uh, would make a big difference. And uh, at that time, she did not express uh, an interest in leading the West Side team, uh, but you know, she is a very, very, very capable planner. Uh, and so uh, I will be happy to discuss that with her. Commissioner Reyes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Alder uh, Burnett. Commissioner Reyes. Uh Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I, I want to echo what has been said earlier uh, by Commissioners Pillega, Burnett, um, but I also want to uh, make a commitment to all of us, like Commissioner Garza, Commissioner Flores, and Sheer, uh, uh, Sheerwoman uh, uh, Commissioner Cordova, um, as there are Latino planners out there. So um, I think that we all need to be able to provide you with name if you uh, share the job description with us. Especially I'm looking at UIC and the mass, the urban planning program uh, that they have. So we, we, there, are, there are more people out there, uh, Commissioner Cox. So yes. uh, we, we, just, we just need to be able to help you to get, to get those because I think it's important for these planners that are truly going to be inserted in the community, in the neighborhoods, that they are part of the neighborhood because they are they are members of the community. So, um, so you, you we can you know be more than happy to share the resume the job descriptions with the planners that I know. Of. I, I welcome that, and I will say, and it may be uh, you know uh, a little bit unfortunate, but um, a, a number of design professionals, planners, and architects uh, have been laid off as a result of the COVID. Uh, and so this might be a time where they would be interested in, in going into public, public interest uh, work. So we may actually have more applicants as a result of the moment that we're in. So I appreciate your, your assistance in helping me continue uh, to expand, expand our diversity. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner, um, guys, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Moore. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Chairperson, I just wanted to um, echo, I, I believe um, what everyone has said so far that the diversity of the team is very, very important, especially representing the committee. Uh, but I really also wanted to add that um, the um, access um, and the in the best Southwest and the community residents that came out and the way that the planning department went to each region I thought it was phenomenal. It was the first time something like that has been done in a very, very, very long time. I've been around for a while. 
and I really want to applaud you and your team on that. Um, I went to several of those um, meetings and I thought they were very well done. So I just wanted to applaud you and your team on that work. Uh, thank you for that. And I think that the structure that we put in place will allow us to continue that level of engagement. That's why I was uh, very forward in volunteering uh, the planning department to co-host with Alderman Taylor um, a virtual meeting on the Woodlawn Consolidated Plan. We now have the team in place to be able to actually staff that. Commissioner Cox, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate this update and, and we'll probably in future meetings um, come back to you for, for additional updates on various other things that you might want to share with the uh, commission. So thank you. My so pleasure. Much. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you very much. This concludes the, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I first, I guess, oh, I'm sorry. This does conclude the March 19, 2020 meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission. And do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by uh, Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Shaw. Sorry, I should recognize your voice, Commissioner Shaw. Sorry. Commissioner Shaw for the record and seconded by Villegas. B. Commissioner Villegas. Thank you very much. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And uh, aye. you all realize we're moving to an, a meeting, another meeting immediately after this one. Um, so uh, the motion passes to adjourn. This uh, March 19, 2020 meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is now adjourned at 1234 p.m. Thank you very much on May 8th, 2020. Thank you very much. All right. And with that, take a deep breath and we will immediately move into, I know people are taking their quick breaks um, as they need to. But I will go ahead and move into our next meeting, um, which is no longer the morning, but is the afternoon. And so good morning. Oh, no, see, I just did it. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order um, at 12, it's still 1234, according to my clock up here, 1234 and a few seconds into it um, on May 8th, 2020. Before we get into the full meeting agenda for the postponed April 16th, 2020 Chicago Plan Commission meeting, I would like to remind everyone that we are meeting virtually. And as such, please be mindful of your surroundings in terms of noise. These uh, people were very good about that. Just remember to keep your muted when you're not speaking. The meeting is being recorded and is live streamed for public viewing. And lastly, if you are an active participant in the meeting, especially if you are speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will cause audio interference. So I say that the commissioners have heard this, but I say this now to those who may be presenting their, uh, their project. Um, I also want to quickly provide guidance to those who have pre-registered to provide testimony. Um, you, will, you have already received the testimony forms in which you filled out your name and address uh, and so on. And I do have someone who will be speaking at, at the appropriate time. And uh, same thing, you know about limiting your minute, your time to three minutes. Uh, the public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session, but an opportunity for attendees to voice their opinions on a particular proposal. And uh, again, we ask for no interruption or disruption of speakers. Any individual who does disrupt the presentation or any subsequent comment session may be muted and removed from the virtual hearing session. So with that, I will do roll call. And I will go to a new sheet. The roll call. Commissioner Biagi. Here. Commissioner Brumfeld. Here. Commissioner Burnett is multi is here. Yes. I'm gonna call him when I go through this because I think he is here. Commissioner Cordova obviously here. Commissioner Cox. Was just here, so I'm gonna He's, he's on, I'm sure he'll be, he just stepped away, it appears. Um, I'm gonna mark him as present. Um, Commissioner Flores. Here. Commissioner Garrison. Here. Commissioner Grossman. The data on the ground are here in Chicago. Um, Not here, not Commissioner Grossman. Alderman Burnett, Alderman Burnett here. Okay, great, gotcha. Commissioner Kelly. Here. Commissioner Lightfoot, not here. Commissioner Lyons. Here. Commissioner Moore. Here. Commissioner Murphy. Here. 
Commissioner Novada. Here. Commissioner Osterman. Is on. He might have stepped away. I'll come back to him in a second. Commissioner Peterson. He's not here. Okay, he hasn't been here. All right. Commissioner Reyes. Here. Commissioner Sorrell. Here. Commissioner Shaw. Here. Commissioner Sposato, not here. Commissioner Tunney. Here. Commissioner Viegas. Here. Commissioner Wagespach. Here. Okay, did I get Commissioner yeah. Osterman? Uh, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and mark him here, even because his uh, he is his thing is on. So I'm uh, Madam, Madam Chair, there's a, um, just for the record, there's a, a conference call right now with the mayor on a COVID nineteen, so that's why yeah some, some of the aldermen are bouncing back and forth. Yeah, I I saw that that was happening. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, we will go ahead and proceed. Uh, knowing that uh, Osterman um, is is here for our purposes. Um, all right, so we will now take public testimony on the items on the agenda today. I do have one person signed in to speak today. That he has requested to speak on item C-2, the proposed Tribune Tower development. Mr. Butler Adams, uh, we will unmute your microphone and you may proceed. And again, please re be reminded that you will have three minutes to speak. You're very good about staying with that. Um, and uh, so, um, and also for the record, I'm sorry, before you go on, Commissioner Cox is back. So he is marked present thank as well. So go ahead, Commissioner, uh, I mean, Mr. Adams. Uh, thank you again, uh, Commissioners. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Butler Adams. And I did wanna say I am 100% uh, support of uh, this Tribune Tower development of, of 1422, which would become Chicago's second tallest building uh, if built. Um, something I would like for the developers to consider is naming the plaza, DuSable Plaza at Pioneer Court. Pioneer Court, you know, because hence, uh, hence its name was a homestead of uh, DuSable, Chicago's founder. Uh, other than the bus near the Michigan Avenue Bridge, there's nothing in the immediate area that uh, recalls his presence uh, at that particular site. Architecture, the structure seems to be graceful uh, in its simplicity as it soars towards the sky. Uh, the base does harmonize with uh, Tribune Tower's base, but the tower itself is an entity, entity upon its own. Um, I'd like to see some type of texture, perhaps on the north and south facades of the building. The beauty itself of Tribune Tower is it's an all around texture uh, for the architecture of the building itself as it soars into the sky. Perhaps some type of vertical mullions on this new tower will help draw one's eye up the building as well. Um, I will give Alderman Riley some credit uh, when it's due, and that's not often, but his insistence for the developers and the architects to take another whack at the ingress and egress for traffic was a benefit for this project, and I think uh, will be uh, beneficial for the traffic pattern in the area itself. Uh, with that being said, I am a bit disappointed seeing as we're only 30 feet shorter of what could have become Chicago's tallest building. Uh, Sears has been the tallest uh, since 1974, and I was certainly hoping for a, a new reigning king. Uh, um, the making the little plans mentality of the city sometimes seems to go away. Where is the ambition? None of the autumn never seems to go for this. Currently, New York has six super talls, which is anything over 984 feet under construction, uh, under construction and six more planned. Right now, Chicago has one under construction. One Chicago was approved at 11, uh, at over a thousand feet, but it's not gonna reach those heights. Seeing as this particular project has an estimated cost of only $700 million, I don't see why more towers of this kind of nature aren't encouraged. I don't mean necessarily across from a charter school on 63rd Street, but you know, I wouldn't be mad about that either. Perhaps north of Lake Street in Fulton Market now though, but again, with that being said, I do certainly and uh, enthusiastically support this project. It's gonna be a great addition to the Chicago skyline. And I hope we can push for more developments like this in the future, because as you all can see, it's gonna bring in $25 million annually in tax revenue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Adams. And I do wanna note that uh, Mr. Adams has submitted an, an email to the Chicago Planning Commission, which is on record indicating his support uh, and speaking along the lines that we just heard him speak. 
Okay, so now with that, um, I uh, matters to be heard in accordance with the Interagency Planning Referral Act. Obviously, we're not going to approve minutes because we just finished that meeting, so we'll approve probably two sets of minutes at our next meeting. Um, but on the agenda now, in accordance with the Interagency Planning Referral Act, um, is um, I have a motion to approve item number one under disposition. Okay, sorry. So we do we do have an item for disposition. Do I have a motion for that to approve that? So moved, um, Commissioner Shaw. Second, Commissioner Garza. Commissioner Garza seconds that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any Aye. abstentions? Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Um, now we'll move on to the public hearing presentation por portion for matters submitted in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. First item on the agenda is a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by 113 East Oak Street LLC for the property generally located at 113 East Oak Street and within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. The property is zoned DX-5, Downtown Mixed Use District. The applicant is proposing to construct a new two-story commercial building. The subject property is in the 42nd Ward and Commissioner Butler, some of us old timers still are happy that Sears Tower is the tallest tower in the city of Chicago. So, Ms. Sperry, Heidi Sperry will provide the context overview and the applicant will present the proposal. I just want to confirm with the tech that you can hear me. We can hear you. Yes. Okay, wonderful. And now is the screen visible? Your desktop is visible. So you see the uh, plan commission? No. no, we see that you have Amazon Music. I want to know what's on there. <laughs> All right, there we go. Chicago Plan Commission. Oh, you went backwards. Oh, you okay. had it. Sorry. There it is. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon. I'm Heidi Sperry with the Department of Planning and Development, and I'm joined today by representatives of the project team for 113 East Oak Street. This application has been filed for review by the Chicago Plan Commission under the Lake Michigan and Chicago uh, Lakefront Protection Ordinance. The subject site is located at 113 East Oak Street on the city's near north side within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. The site is situated in the Oak Street Commercial Corridor and the uh, Central Area Action Plan of 2009 is the prevailing plan for this area. The proposed project complies with the goals of the Central Area Action Plan by strengthening the Oak Street Retail Corridor through the redevelopment of the site. The property is located on Oak Street, just west of Michigan Avenue. The location is well served by public transportation with five major CTA bus routes stopping within 600 feet of the site. Additionally, the site is located in the 42nd Ward and Alderman Brendan Riley has provided a letter to the Plan Commission expressing his support for the project. The site is zoned DX5, which is downtown mixed use and no zoning changes are being sought at this time. As previously stated, the site is in the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront District. Therefore, any physical change to the property requires the review and approval of Plan Commission. The applicant proposes to demolish the existing three-story commercial building on the site and construct a new two-story commercial building. Jack George from the law firm of Ackerman LLP, who represents the applicant, will now provide additional details on this proposal. Jack? And I am an attorney and I represent the applicant owners of this property. Uh, as Heidi indicated, this is a matter that uh, is a lakefront protection application. 
we're not seeking any zoning changes or any other type of zoning relief for this project. Uh, we filed this on January the 8th uh, of 2020. Uh, this is, as Heidi indicated in the 42nd Ward, Alderman Brendan Riley. We met with Alderman Brendan Riley, of course, before we ever filed this. I reached out also to the Magnificent Mile Association and alerted them to what we were doing and sent them some plans. Uh, at that time, they said that they didn't require that I appear before them. And then I just sent them not too long ago, the revised plans and, and project uh, forms so that they could again see the latest ones. And I've heard nothing in response from them. So I believe that they're fine with our project. And of course, we met with the Department of Development and Planning on numerous occasions in order to make sure that we were complying with all of the policies and provisions of the Lakefront Protection application. Uh, as you'll hear from the architect shortly, we've incorporated the, the changes that we've made are we've incorporated face brick on the north facade of the building, and we've incorporated face brick on the east and west facade returns. We've also incorporated a granite face at the base of the glass on the front facade. And so those are the changes that you'll hear the architect discuss from now on. Thank you. Michael. For the record, this is Heidi Sperry. Michael, I would just ask that you state your name and your association uh, prior to starting your presentation. Yes, my name is Michael Cody. I am with Ware Malcolm Architects. We're the architects for the project. What you see here is a photo of the existing structure, the existing outdated structure, which will be removed and replaced with the new two-story building. Um, next slide, please. This is a uh, photo, kind of a closer uh, up image of the building relating it to the pedestrian context. We were very focused on what's the experience from the street level of the building. Uh, and you can see that we've, we've tied it into the rest of the street and we've also uh, put it in character to the pedestrians. Next slide, please. This is an overall site plan of the building showing the one more, uh, the one mag mile building just to the east of us at the top of the page. Uh, the site plan itself kind of shows that we are taking up the, the lot with the new structure and we're providing a new tree and a tree grate in, at the uh, pedestrian street. Next slide, please. These are the floor plans of the proposed building. Uh, you can see it's a two-story building with a partial basement uh, simply for utilities. Uh, the uh, structure will be retail. Next slide, please. Same, uh, this seems to be the same floor plan slide. If we can go to the next slide. Sorry, maybe I have a delay. Uh, these are the building elevations, the north elevation, which is the street side. This is the Oak Street side and the east elevation. The east elevation is will be constructed entirely in face brick uh, because it is going to be visible. There is no building beside it. One mag mile building is uh, separated from our building by several feet. Next slide, please. This is the south alley side uh, elevation as well as the west elevation, which abuts the building uh, uh, next to it. We are returning the face brick just so that the building will be entirely, uh, everything visible will be face, face brick. Next slide, please. This is a building section just showing the, I think the most prominent feature of this is the, uh, the height of the building. The top of the parapet wall will be 44 feet. You can see that it's a two-story building with a uh, utility type basement. Next slide, please. These are some of the details of the building indicating that we've, we've got uh, an enhanced architectural storefront system that we're utilizing. That'll be a little bit better visible in uh, the next slide, I believe. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, this, this is showing our materials for the project. We're, we're using uh, brick, a very high performance glazing system and an architectural uh, uh, storefront system with uh, mullion caps that will provide further expression. We're also utilizing a black granite 
base uh, at the uh, sidewalk. Next slide. I think I toss it back to Jack here. Thanks, Michael. Uh, the public benefits are, as Michael has outlined them very clearly from an architectural standpoint, where we're now beginning providing a new building, replacing an inefficient building. When you look in what was there before and what will now be replacing it, and Oak Street, which is such an important retail street in our city, this will be a real enhancement. And uh, we are now going to be having retail present consistent with the other standards on Oak Street. And we will have be providing some new construction jobs, 35, which during the time the construction is going on. But overall, we just believe that this new building replacing the old building that was there, which was really in poor condition, overall, it will be a great enhancement to our city and to this retail area on the near north side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. This is Heidi Sperry for the record. DPD has reviewed the project materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal is in compliance with the applicable policies of the lakefront protection, the, pro, the policies of the lakefront plan of Chicago and the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance as they apply to the development in the public in the private use zone. Specifically, these policies are Policy eight, the proposed commercial development will reactivate a long vacant property and increase pedestrian foot traffic on Oak Street, thereby increasing personal safety in the area. Policy 10, the project enhances the community, uh, the lakefront edges of the community, but does not propose uh, private development east of Lakeshore Drive. And policy 14, the proposed development has coordinated with all city departments, the aldermen, and the Magnificent Mile Association. Finally, with regard to purpose 10, the proposed development is being undertaken in accordance with all applicable regulations and provisions of the area in which the property is located. The density of the proposed development is consistent with the existing zoning district. The height of the proposed building is consistent with the height of other buildings in the immediate context. Given the scale of the proposed development, the, lake, the location of the property and the proposed design of the building, there is no substantial conflict with the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance or the basic policies of the Lakefront Plan of Chicago. Thank you so much, Ms. Berry. Uh, finally, just to wrap up uh, with uh, DPD's uh, recommendations, with res um, based on the foregoing, uh, DPD recommends that the application being in conformance with the provisions of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance be approved subject to compliance with the site lands and landscape plans, as well as the building elevations that were presented to you today. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions for staff or the applicant from commissioners? I'm not seeing any questions. And what about Alderman Riley? Do we have a statement or has he submitted a written statement? This Alderman is Riley, did... Oh, you're there. I'm sorry, what, what was said? I'm, I missed what just got said. Is the Alderman on the line? This is Jack George. Alderman Riley did submit a, a letter of support for the project. Okay. Okay. I don't have that in front of me, but we'll, that's great. So we do have then on record a letter of support from Alderman Riley for this project. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions or comments from commissioners. Um, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Cox. My hand is raised. Uh, and it's not, oh, I'm sorry. It sure is. My, I didn't see it. Uh, no forgive me. Go ahead. Um, uh, th th thank you uh, to the presenters. Uh, a very handsome, uh, very handsome addition to the street. Uh, I'm, I certainly am pleased with the um, alterations that were made. Uh, uh, at I know uh, in a conversation with the DPD staff. Uh, just one thing I want to make uh, clear. I think the choice of uh, the black brick. Uh, is it very will be very very handsome, and I just want to make sure I understand that it it um, it is going to apply to the 
uh, blind side, the party wall side uh, that is still visible from the street. I just wanna make sure that the material palette will continue uh, in that fashion. How far does it go back and will, uh, you know, will, will, will people see the continuity of the brick from the front to the, to the sides? Yes, uh, this is Mike Cody with Ware Malcolm Architects. And yes, all, all visible portions of the building will be the black brick. So everything from the, the street side pedestrian focus, uh, the, the transition of materials only occurs where it abuts the adjacent structure and will not be visible. Excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm assuming, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm also assuming that uh, the, that the structural, there's a lot of glass uh, and your engineers have assured you uh, that you don't need any kind of structural column uh, on the front of this building. Michael, I'd call my on apologies. you to respond. Sure. My apologies. Yes, we have spent a lot of time analyzing the structure of it. We actually do have a column buried sorry, into can that. You state your, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you, uh, you're going to have to start again. Can you state your name for the record, please? I'm sorry. Again, Michael Cody with Ware Malcolm Architects. And yes, we have uh, spent a lot of time with the structure. We actually have a column buried into that corner of the, the mullions, but we've done it in such a fashion to uh, uh, conceal it. Excellent. No, uh, very, very handsome uh, storefront. I look forward to walking by it. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, I do not see any more hands raised. Um, and so then uh, that, I'm sorry. And just also to uh, clarify, the letter from Alderman Riley's office did come in this morning, um, which is why I didn't have a copy of it. But we do have it on the record. So now. Uh, any no further questions then? Do I have a motion on the proposed Lakefoot Protection Ordinance application which seeks to allow for the construction of a new two-story, not the tall one that I that I thought, story commercial building, finding that meets the requirements for approval? Is that a motion? So moved. So so moved. moved by Commissioner Cox, seconded by Commissioner Shaw. Um, and is there any converse, any discussion by the commissioners on this motion? Seeing none, I will do a roll call vote. And that I will begin with Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Um, Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Grossman. Commissioner Kelly. Yes. Commissioner Lightfoot is not here. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. Commissioner Osterman. Commissioner Peterson is not here. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Sposato is not here. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Commissioner Villegas. And Commissioner Wagespach. Yes. Okay, fantastic. The motion passes. Um, great, thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. So now this is the one. All right, the next, not the one, but the one that uh, uh, Madam Butler was, or Butler Adams rather, rather was referring to. The next item on the agenda is a proposed plan development submitted by Tribune Tower East. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, yes. this is Alderman Villegas. I'd like to be recorded as a yes. I apologize. Oh, no, no, no problem. Way to take a call right quick. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, recorded as a yes, Alderman Villegas on the last item. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next item on the agenda is a proposed plan development submitted by Tribune Tower East Chicago owner LLC for the property generally located at 421-451 North Michigan Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the subject property from DX-12 downtown mixed use and DX-16 downtown mixed use to a unified 
DX-12 downtown mixed use, and then to a residential business plan development. The applicant is renovating the existing building on the western portion of the site and intends to develop the eastern portion of the site with a mixed use building 1,442 feet in height containing 564 dwelling units as well as 200 hotel rooms. The overall plan development will contain 726 dwelling units, 686 accessory vehicular parking stalls, and 14 loading berths. The subject property is in the 42nd Ward. Noah Zanfraniak will present the context overview and the applicant will present the proposal. Good afternoon. Uh, can I check and see, does everyone hear me and see my screen? We can hear you. Beautiful. I we can see your screen as well. Perfect. For the record, my name is Noah Sopranic and I am with the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, the proposed development is generally located at 421 North Michigan Avenue. It's located within the near north side community area of the 42nd Ward. The applicant, Tribune Tower East Chicago Owner LLC, and their development team appear here virtually today for the purposes of establishing a residential business plan development on this subject site. This request is being submitted as a mandatory plan development application due to the fact that the proposed project will first exceed 390 feet in height, contain more than 350 dwelling units, and in the underlying DX12 designation, seek to utilize the neighborhood opportunity fund. And this will be done to increase the allowable FAR from 12.0 to 15.31. The subject site is uh, located in the central planning region uh, in the, indicated in the gold on the slide above. And the site is situated in the near north side community area, which is comprised of various neighborhoods such as Streeterville, the Gold Coast, River North, and Old Town. The subject site is currently improved with the Chicago Landmark Tribune Tower. The existing landmark building was commissioned in 1922, completed in the neo-Gothic style, and the building was designed by two architects, John Mee Howells and Raymond Hood. The proposed plan development site is highlighted on the screen in yellow. It is currently zoned DX12 and DX16. The entire site is proposed to be rezoned to a unified underlying designation of DX12. And then the applicant will utilize the neighborhood opportunity fund bonus to increase the overall FAR to 15.31. The applicant will cover additional details on that aspect later in this presentation. The subject site is located in close proximity to a variety of transit options. This includes various CTA bus routes, CTA train stations at the bottom of the slide located along Lake Street that are between one quarter and one half mile of the site, a couple water taxi stations, the closest of which is less than a quarter of a mile southwest of the site, and also four Divi bicycle stations that are located within one quarter mile of the subject site. The plan development is proposed to be divided into three sub areas. Sub area A, the Western portion is as mentioned, the occupied by the Chicago Landmark Tribune Tower. Sub area B on the uh, East portion is currently improved with a surface parking lot and is the primary location of the proposed development that you're about to see. And then sub area C, located just to the south of these two parcels is the uh, Pioneer Court Plaza area. On the screen above is just a proposed context plan. The intent here is to provide some general sense of space and direction as you head into the applicant's portion of this presentation. Uh, Michigan Avenue appears uh, on the left of the slide, situated to the west. Illinois Street located just north of the proposal. And uh, on the east of the proposal, uh, City Front Plaza Drive and then on the south, Pioneer Court, and further south of that, uh, the, uh, what you know as the Apple Store, and just immediately south of that, the Chicago River. This project has gone through extensive community outreach. The applicant has held uh, two community-wide meetings, six additional meetings with Alderman Riley's office, meetings with uh, the local neighborhood groups, CCWA, SOAR, and the 240 East Illinois residents. Meetings have also uh, been conducted with the Department of Planning and Development and the Department of Transportation. And all of the aforementioned community participation has resulted in a number of design revisions that have resulted in lower level traffic, uh, pedestrian and traffic improvements, upper level traffic improvements, and a revised Pioneer Court design. At this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to the applicant, um, their attorney, Mr. Jack George, as well as the architect, Mr. Gordon Gill. 
Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gordon Gill, partner Adrian Smith plus Gordon Gill Architecture. We are the architects for the proposed tower on parcel B. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the members of the commission for hosting us today and for allowing us to present this project. As Noah said, we've had some fantastic feedback from our public meetings and from the aldermen. Um, and with that, I would just like to walk you through um, the presentation from the lower levels to the upper level and then the building, the building itself. Um, starting with the lower level that you might see on your screen, um, looking at the existing photographs, just to give you an orientation on North Water Street, uh, Lower Illinois, bottom left-hand corner, um, some of the pedestrian areas that currently exist on the lower level in the center. You can see some of the um, challenges that are down there with obstacles in the way of our path of the pedestrian movement and then North Water Street on the right-hand side. Next, please. Uh, these are the improvements of those uh, very areas. Um, we propose a significant uh, improvement in terms of pedestrian movement, sidewalks, the connect connectivity of those sidewalks throughout the area. On the top is the North Water Street arrival area for parcel A. Bottom left-hand corner is a southeast view from Lower Illinois, looking at the arrival into the lower level of parcel B. In the center is that same view where you can see majority of the obstacles have been removed. The lighting levels have been increased. And in the bottom right-hand corner is the space uh, within our parcel at the lower level. Um, majority of these improvements are focused on safety um, on a kind of clarity of, of path, line of sight for pedestrians, not just for our project, but I would say also for the entire community and for those who traverse this area. Um, next, please. Moving up to the existing photographs of the upper deck, um, northeast corner from Pioneer Court, looking into the site as it currently is today. Bottom left-hand corner is looking from City Front Plaza a pioneer court would be on your left. Um, and then in the right hand side is a southwest view from Illinois Street. Next, please. Um, from an urban design standpoint, we have set a number of uh, very important principles associated with this project. Um, probably one of the most important, if not the most important, above and uh, or next to the public realm is the Ogden view slip, which you should see on your far right. Um, there is a view corridor that requires us to maintain the facade of the existing Tribune Tower. We have actually moved the building north of that uh, to actually increase that view cone. Um, we would definitely have a, um, a challenge with the uh, sewer level, which is the middle image that you see with the red line. That's at Lower Illinois. There is a uh, no build zone associated with that, which is actually helping us, frankly, to site the tower in the northeast corner and to shift that away from the existing building. One of the very important principles we have is the harmonious relationship between our podium and the existing podium along Pioneer Court. Um, we'll get into that detail in a minute. And overall, creating a, a kind of pedestrian friendly, very welcoming, um, public realm on Pioneer Court, and in fact, all the way around the building at all levels. Next, please. Um, architecturally, um, there's a very significant um, strength to the existing building, obviously. The kind of laced, sinuous uh, characters of the Gothic style, um, very strong verticality, as you can see. We represent those in the pink and orange lines that you see, and there's a very strong rhythm of that verticality, not just in the tower, but also in the podium. And we kind of refer to that as the A and B rhythm. And we'll show you how we pick that up in the podium and then walk that around the tower and take that up uh, in the facades of the proposed tower. Next, please. So starting at the upper deck, we would like to just walk you around the improvements or the design that we currently have starting uh, with number one in the northwest corner of the site, 
and then moving around to City Front Plaza and then to Pioneer Court, just to give you an overall sense of our character of the building. Uh, next, please. So this first one is really uh, on Illinois Street, looking east. You are now arriving at the Hotel Porcochere on your right-hand side, identified by the canopy above. Um, you see the character of the transparency at grade. Next, please. And then moving toward the corner on City Front Plaza and Illinois, you're looking back toward Michigan on the right-hand side, looking south along City Front, and you're now looking at the arrival of the condo and rental uh, lobbies. Um, you then see in this um, specific rendering the verticality and the expression on the east facade, which is the facade above the canopy. On the north facade, I'll get into more detail on that in a second, they're primarily glass and spandrel panels with a, vertical, a verticality of detail in the facade. You see those pipe-like uh, expressions. We'll talk about the materiality and the character of those. So there are several layers of verticality. Some are more subtle than others. Some are very strong, such as the east and west facades and also the podium. Next, please. Stepping back from that very same view, you get a larger sense of, of the space and its relationship to City Front Plaza. And in the foreground are some of the improvements that have been made to the roundabout that currently exists. Next, please. So um, of tremendous importance to us and of special focus to us um, is Pioneer uh, Court and the character of the architecture in this particular area is doing multiple things. Number one, you're looking at a glass fluted vertical expression on the podium. The parking is behind that facade and is 100% obscured. Um, it cannot be seen and we'll show you a detail of that later. What you're looking at on the facade is the, the kind of glass flutes are kind of the primary vertical expression and then the tubes that you see there are the secondary vertical expression that wrap all the way around. They pick up the height and the character of the existing podium and wrap all the way around to the entrance of the tower and then become the vertical expression on the east and west sides. So you're seeing that character wrap up, around and up. Um, the retail space is very important to us to bring the scale down and to pick up that regulating line of the existing podium. So that continuity is met. Um, we're seeing good transparency at the lower level and really scaling it down to create a welcoming atmosphere related to the pedestrian realm. Next, please. Um, this view is actually in the Port Cochere drop off for the hotel. We'll talk about the traffic in a minute and the ability to, for it to pull all of the traffic off of Illinois uh, for the hotel arrival. This is obviously an all weather space. Um, but for architecturally, we have no um, intention of creating any, any environments that are less than um, commensurate with the quality of the neighborhood and the quality of, frankly, Chicago and the kind of class A environment that we expect of a project like this. So it's very well lit, it's architecturally treated. We're looking into the lobby of the Port Cochere. And uh, in this particular case, there are two points of reference for you, one to Illinois Street to your left, and then City Front Plaza to the right. So there's always an orientation. There's no sense of being in a cave in this particular case. Next, please. So from a planning standpoint or from a plan standpoint, starting with the lower level, um, there are a couple of points that I think are important for us to make here. Number one is we introduced the idea of having secondary lobbies on the street at Illinois. That is to activate the street level and create a sense of neighborhood and environment. So there are no dead walls along the primary streets whatsoever. Um, we've also introduced two points of security, maybe a little hard to see in the plan, but there's one at the very north, there's a desk right by that door. And there's also one on the south end in a security office. So both um, points of entry and egress on this, on this um, site are very well um, overseen. Um, we see a very active environment down here, the building docks are discreetly located on the south side. And if you look very closely, you'll see two little dog park areas. One is private and one is also public. Um, so we're very, very interested in programming this. 
majority of the traffic or all of the traffic for the residential arrives at this level. The uh, residential, there's no access to parking above. All of the parking access is here where you see the ramp. And so again, it's pulled in into the right of way, which was that sewer no build zone that we've then utilized for kind of arrival. Next, please. Um, this is a, the system of kind of connectivity that I was referring to before in the renderings, the orange being the sidewalk and pedestrian realm that's create, creating the connectivity as it would in any, um, any street block. Um, again, the blue would be the uh, loading and discrete service areas on the, on the south end. Next, please. And a little more detail in terms of, uh, of, in terms of the traffic. Um, I think what you're look, what you're seeing here is really the dark the dark line or the solid line is the arrival pattern. The dotted line is the exit pattern. Again, um, all access to parking is at this lower level. Um, there's there's no access at the upper level. And I think from a strategic standpoint, the access and egress to the site has been designed to be very flexible to allow a fluid movement of vehicle traffic so as not to create any kind of congestion on the street. Next, please. The plan. Um, we're back up at the deck. Um, just some information that you may, may already have grasped, but very simply, um, the Porca share that comes in off of Illinois and then through to City Front Plaza. The tower plan in the right northeast corner, defined by the hotel in the light blue the condo lobby in the yellow, and the rental lobby in the pink area. Um, the condo and rental have arrival um, are, uh, on the city front plaza where we have four cars, four vehicles able to be stacked there. Um, but all of the primary access for residential, which would be the everyday coming home and going to work is all at the lower level. The pink or sorry, the purple area that you see is the retail area that connects all the way across from the existing building to our podium. And the ramp that you see in that diagram is actually the ramp from below coming up and going to the parking above. Next, please. Again, the traffic diagram here, um, just to articulate that this is really a one-way counterclockwise circulation um, for the internal access and uh, there is uh, no curbside parking or loading um, permitted along Illinois Street in the traffic plan. Um, the numbers that you see in those bubbled areas are in the Porca shares, the number of vehicles that are permitted to stop there or allowed to stop, designed to stop there. Next, please. Um, this is the program stack of the building as we've designed it today. I would say that you know, um, it's interesting to hear people talk about the height of the building. Um, we've never pursued or been directed to pursue the height as a defining aspect of this project. It's always been programmatically driven. Um, the pink lit area at the base is the retail. Those kind of yellow colors that you see there are the lobbies that we mentioned for the, for the condo and the rental. And then moving up in the tower, we have the green area, which is the hotel. The yellow area, which is primary, which is the rental uh, units, and then the condo units stacked above that. Uh, next, please. I have a dark screen. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, so we have a series of renderings and views. I think we. Noah, could we go back one, please? Did we? Or is this the first one? Yeah, I think, sorry, Gordon, I think we lost the first one in the transmittal here. Sorry. Uh oh. Um, okay. Um, let's go to the next one then, please, Noah. Um, so I'll try to describe what the first one was. It was the view from the southwest aerial view looking down toward Pioneer Plaza and getting a real sense of the arrival from Michigan Avenue from, uh, from that point of view. Um, the tower itself is. Um, kind of singular in, in, in its expression. Um, it's very monolithic, um, quiet, but we hope um, presents a kind of strength and power representative of Chicago. Um, it's not trying to do a lot of things. It doesn't need to at 1,422 feet. Um, the east and west facades have vertical expression on them that are 
helping with the sustainable sun shading of those uh, facades. And then it's very easy for us to control north and south facades. In this particular view, looking from the southeast, you get a good look at the podium and the podium roof, which will get great southern light, uh, have great views onto um, Pioneer Court as well as the as well as the river. Next, please. Um, back to the Ogden Slip view, um, you can see the tower is shifted toward the north, um, and the north and south facades kind of race up the, the height of the building and express themselves at the very top of the building in that kind of lace-like um, gothic expression of the existing, just a little nod or a little wink to the, the, the um, existing tower. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the details of that, these facades in a minute, because I think we, we close with that. Next, please. Uh, from the lake, um, this building will obviously take its position amongst the skyline and help to um, articulate the kind of growth or pattern of, of super talls in Chicago. Um, we're very excited about this, um, being able to contribute to this uh, with, our, with our firm. And so we're very excited about the character of this building and its role within the context of, of Chicago. Next, please. Um, for your request, we've included a number of um, plans um, that are basically a little more detail regarding the site plan at the lower level and upper level. Um, I don't think there's anything here in particular. Um, the, the movement patterns and the, and the spaces that we've created for the vehicular are, are gracious and, and very comfortable, we feel. Um, next, please. We've done a number of tests and we'll continue to do that as I'm sure as the market defines the program in the hotel, rental and condo. Um, we feel very good about the interior quality of these buildings and these units as they're taking great advantage of the fantastic views that this building will have. Next, please. A uh, roof plan. Um, looking um, at the podium levels, you'll see an arc in the podium, uh, a line in the podium there that kind of defines two levels of podium rooftop deck that look onto Pioneer Court. Um, those are really relegated for the condo and uh, hotel uh, areas. And so there is landscape up there that has a dis uh, lang uh, discussion or a relationship to the existing building and if you remember the existing building there's a court a courtyard in that space so we made um, very very close um, coordination in terms of pulling the tower away from that in order to allow light and air into that space next please um, the elevations um, very simply this building will have a high performance uh, glass facade um, it will have texture on the north and south due to the operable window as well as a um, ceramic frit. I, I do want to congratulate the city on um, passing the bird ordinance. We're huge supporters and fans of that, especially as it relates to super tall. Um, we are very um, well uh, versed with this subject um, for the last 25 years. In fact, we just finished a building in Toronto downtown, which has a very strict bird ordinance um, as it relates to species and migrational patterns, the heights of those patterns that come across um, the fritted glass that we know has to be a certain size and a certain pattern, um, really looking at the visual noise on the building that helps the birds stay away and understand the form, which is why the texture is so important from a sustainable standpoint, but also from a bird standpoint. Um, and also kind of the, the lighting character of this building that needs to be soft and subtle. In Toronto, in fact, they actually require that buildings turn off their lights. Um, if they have architectural lighting at certain times of the year because of migratory species. Um, so we're very sensitive to this. Um, thank you for passing that ordinance. We're, we're very excited about that. And I think it will make all the buildings in Chicago just, just better. Um, so we're very happy about that. Next, please. Uh, the south and west elevations on the west, you can see the vertical expression and the texture again, um, the, the, the south. Um, very simple, very um, hopefully elegant facades. Next, please. And then, and then the um, east and west um, sections um, as, as requested. Next, please. 
so here's the here's the podium discussion that I think um, I just wanted to jump into and articulate a little more. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion about the character of this piece as it relates to the public realm and also the parking. On the right hand side at the top, you'll see the plan uh, or a segment of the plan uh, with a cavity wall uh, behind the glass and a solid uh, CMU or concrete block wall that obscures the parking. So in no way, shape or form is the parking visible in any way through this facade. Uh, what we're attempting to create here is really hopefully a beautiful but very subtle and sophisticated relationship between art and architecture. Um, architecturally, we understand its expression and its relationship to the existing podium. From an art standpoint, from an artful standpoint, we hope to uh, include a very low level, very subtle um, bathing of light um, behind this wall in the evenings to create a very soft lantern effect on the plaza. Um, we think that the movement of sunlight across this uh, particular texture will be very rich uh, and very um, attractive during the day. And then at night, it can have a very um, sophisticated role as the public realm on the plaza comes to life in the evenings. Um, next, please. So here we are with just a couple of details um, to be specific about the facades and the texture of the character. Um, as I mentioned, you see the vertical expression on the left-hand side. This is really um, a typical detail or typical um, view of the north or south facades. Um, so the vertical expression is kind of the secondary means of vertical expression that relates to the Tribune building. There would obviously be a number of operable windows integrated into these facades, and those tend to have uh, a thicker frame around them for when they open and close. And so there's, a, there's another level of detail in that facade. Um, these facades really function as kind of the shields on the north and south. Um, which have the non-glare light on the north side and then the overhead light uh, from the south on the south side. And then the, the dark brown or tan area that you see adjacent to that would be typical of the east and west. You're looking at an oblique view. So there is a glass facade behind that that would have good views out to the east and west. But the depth of that million will calculate um, using, our, using our models to really understand the relationship of the sunlight and what it does to those facades and how we can protect this building from the east and west um, from, from heat gain and heat loss. Um, I think I've kind of uh, covered most of the points. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Brad McCauley, who's the managing principal of Site Design Group to speak to you specifically about the design of Pioneer Court. All right, thanks Gordon Gill. Um, also, thanks, uh, Madam Chair, as well as commissioners and, uh, and NOAA for all the support kind of leading up to this, as well as uh, advancing the slides. As Gordon had mentioned, my name is Bram McCauley. I'm the managing principal at Site Design Group. Um, we've had the privilege of working with the team to, to really work on um, Pioneer Court, kind of moving it forward. So just to dive in, I wanted to make sure that we kind of reoriented everybody with, uh, with Pioneer Court, which is the area south of the Tribune Tower. Um, just a reminder, and I know Noah did a really good job running through things early on. Uh, north is up on the plan, so to the top of the screen, west to the left, east to the right. So the plaza is a very interesting space. It's, it's got a lot of different, we'll say, stakeholders and owners surrounding the area. So the, to the north, you've got the Tribune. To the south, you've got 401 North, the, the Equitable Building. Uh, to the southeast, you have the Gleacher Center, which has a, a share within Pioneer Court. And then right through the center of it, you also have a bit of right away that, uh, that kind of blends the, the area for all, all of these places. Um, take all that into consideration and then put this all on top of a bridge. And that's what we have to, uh, to work with to put a landscape here. So everything is on structure. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the, the original design that was presented is shown at the top. Uh, we were brought in to really take a look at that, uh, working with Commissioner Cox, working with the DPD staff and the, the design team, uh, we were receiving comments just noting that it's, uh, it was a little bit more civic, a little bit more linear, um, and, and kind of, um, it was just a, a different combination than I think we were looking for for the plaza. After kind of working through with the team and, and um, 
looking at the DPD principles and making sure that we're integrating um, all those within the design, we were able to work and come up with the concept that you see at the bottom. Um, some of the most notable things in here, I'm gonna get my stat sheet just to make sure that I've got these right. We were able to really increase a lot of the zones. Um, the previous design up at the top, we had roughly about 3,500 square feet of green space. Uh, the new design at the bottom actually has close to um, 16,200. So that's an increase of over 350% green space um, working through the DPD process. Um, additional things, uh, trees. The previous design only had 14. We were up to 19 shade trees. Um, and we're also adding ornamental trees, shrub species, quite a bit more natural habitat to really increase that kind of natural benefit within the neighborhood. Um, some other things to note before I get into more detail on the design is uh, the, the original design at the top you'll see really kind of focuses this as a plaza and, and really kind of connects everything. Um, working through the process, we realized that there really should be three distinct zones um, to the north and immediately adjacent to the Tribune Tower. Uh, that really is a promenade and, and really focuses on the retail and, and kind of keeps the Tribune Tower. Uh, it gives it a little bit of a threshold as well as a, a space for people to get from city from plaza to um, to Michigan Avenue kind of clearly and, and also opens up the retail corridor. Um, to the south, you have the Equitable Plaza, which is a little bit relentless in its existing state out there. So what we did there was kind of give that a, an end, um, really keep that pattern, but really, really diet. Uh, where, it, where it stops, we've created this really central corridor. And what we've done there is carved out um, quite a bit of space for, uh, for the community and, and for uh, just people to get an, an area of respite. You can go to the next slide, please. So within the design, and I've got some imagery in the next slide just to really showcase what we have here. Uh, we really wanted to provide a lot of different opportunities in here. Um, not everybody likes large open spaces. And um, so we wanted to make sure we gave them options. Um, to kind of go through the design, and I'll go from west, so from left to east to the right. Um, one of the biggest gestures that you'll see within the plaza is the Pioneer Path. Um, and that has the number eight in the middle, but that really cuts all the way through. And this is a very intentional spine of the project. Um, not only, you know, it, it, in rush hour or, you know, in the middle of the day on lunch, you see a lot of people cutting through uh, the plaza. This gives them a deliberate path, but it also um, get, really focuses your views and, and gives you um, really a creative way to get through the space. So if you're heading to the east, you would actually be perfectly uh, aligned with City Front Plaza. And if you're working your way west, you actually would be lined up with the Wrigley Building. So you'd be able to pass right through there and it really frames your views and kind of creates that corridor. And I'll speak a little bit more about that path as we work through. Um, on the far west, you'll see three square planters. Um, and that's mimicked on the far east. Um, the thought here was really breaking down the city grid. Uh, you know, North, North Michigan Avenue, you have these granite planters with trees in them. We wanted to not just give an abrupt change to that, but really start to soften the edges and, and welcome people into the park space. Um, you'll see at the number three, there's the, the Jack Brickhouse sculpture. Uh, it's as close to where it's, it's currently sits. We wanted to uh, retain its prominence and, and get it there within the plaza space. Um, through the central corridor, you'll see kind of three different planting zones. Uh, and this is where we start to get into those different scales and different sizes of uh, opportunity for people to use the space. So to the west, uh, we have the, the number four area. This is actually a, a kind of a tilted lawn. Um, the thought there is that people can go, they can throw down a blanket, um, they can enjoy the lawn space and it actually tilts down towards the equitable plaza. So when there's events, I know that there's, you know, the, the parades that go on or um, there's always something happening there outside of the Apple store. It kind of frames your view and, and kind of allows for um, different events to take place within the plaza. Working your way east, you'll see kind of these north-south connections. Um, that's just meant to get people from the plaza up to the retail and give them different opportunities. So what we're proposing there are boulders, different types of seating, just something to really start to blend this from the street into more of a natural landscape that you'll see moving east. Kind of the darker green space where the trees are, the thought here again is, is uh, raised planters. I mentioned that this is all in a bridge structure in order to get trees in there. And I think that was a big goal made clear by the ownership as well as working with DPD and Commissioner Cox. Um, all these planters need to be raised up to get you know, 30 inches or 36 inches for the larger trees uh, to make sure we're giving them the soil so they can actually survive out there. Um, and the thought here is that you're kind of working your way through a natural landscape as you work your way all the way to City Front Plaza. So it kind of gives you that gradient from the, the city at the sides and really blends your way into the development. 
um, if you want to go to the, the next slide. So what some of those things might look like, I mentioned the Jack Brickhouse sculpture, just a reminder for those that uh, aren't familiar with the sculpture. Um, I'll talk about the planting, then I'll get back to kind of the second image. Um, you can see the, the planting images at the top uh, right there, the top three. Uh, the thought is that we're going to have this very lush planting plan. Uh, where we can, where the shade study allows, we want to get you know uh, as many flowers as we can as possible. It will all be perennials. The goal is to be native or adapted species, so things last and it helps with maintenance costs. Uh, trees, we want to make sure that they, they don't just show up as twigs out there in the lawn. We wanted to make sure that it's something a little bit more sizable, so a minimum uh, we're proposing is four inch caliper for the trees, but we also have other tree species that are up to five or six inches. So we're gonna have really nice trees and it'll have an impact from, from day one. Uh, the top right image there with the uh, lawn, this is just to give you an idea of what that lawn can feel like. A little sloped, uh, it'll be sloped down towards, you know, where the sun shines. So it really makes it even more of a desirable space to go. And, and as we mentioned before, it'll frame that view of the equitable plaza. Um, one of the big gestures that we had mentioned was Pioneer Path, so kind of the bottom left image, and then the uh, second from the left on the top. Uh, we really wanted to pay, we'll say, homage to uh, what, the, what the plaza really once was. It was called Pioneer Plaza for a reason. There was a fountain that had 25 founding pioneers from the city of Chicago uh, etched within the side of it. That went away, and, and now the, the name of the plaza kind of is just there. Um, so to kind of pay tribute to that, we wanted to bring back the plaza and actually put the names all within the banding along the side of that. So you'd see a nice granite band uh, with all these pioneers within it kind of stretching throughout the space. So not only is it a way to get through the place or through the space, it's also kind of a bit of history that really kind of ties everything back and, and brings that, that, that element that was lost, I think, by the city of Chicago. So we're, we're really excited to reintroduce that to the space. And then kind of working your way through the other pictures, the, the thought there is really just I wanted to show some of the other textures and elements that would be within the plaza. So we mentioned boulders and various types of seating and cafe spaces along the top uh, promenade. So just kind of give you a flavor of, of what would happen out there. And then on the last page, and I think um, my last page, sorry, this I think this is part of the, uh, the rendering that uh, Gordon lost in his portion of the presentation, but this is zoomed in to kind of show what that, what that would look like, I think, if you're sitting in the Wrigley Building, um, just kind of what the space would be like and, and how it really starts to create a green spine within a corridor that currently is, is a lot of pavement. So we're, we're really happy um, how this is turning out and, and uh, really happy to propose this to everybody. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jack George with Ackerman to, to bring us home. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brad. <clears throat> uh, this slide here that's in front of you now, uh, talks about the sustainability matrix. And uh, this building, plan developments such as this are required to have a uh, 100 points. Uh, and if you can, in the light, in the right hand box there, you'll see that we are gonna be a LEED gold certified building. So we get 90 points from that. And then it identifies the other points that we're gonna be getting to equal 110. So we will be exceeding what's required. And that's the sustainability matrix is, is set out for people to understand that. Uh, as, uh, as, as Brad and Gordon have talked about, we have spent so much time on developing the landscape of the building and the architecture of the building. This shows that we really are spending a great deal of time concerning about the environmental aspect of the building too. Uh, the next slide, please. This next slide, since this is a mixed use development and portion of it is residential, we have an ARO requirements that must be met. And this slide uh, talks about the, and I've broken down into three different columns. The first column where it says total talks about the total number of units, the for sale units in the rental buildings, in the rental units, and then goes through and identifies the obligation under each. But as was indicated by Noah in the beginning, we have two different parcels here. We have parcels A and parcel B. Parcel A is the existing Tribune building. That's all for sale uh, condominiums. And so there's 162 units there. So there should be 16 units that would be uh, have to be affordable. Uh, and in, this, in our particular case, we are paying for the, the value of those 16 units with that because they won't be on site. And that amounts to $3,813,440 to, to compensate for those. In the next column, column B, parcel B, it talks about the number there of uh, 
rental units and for sale units. There's 13 units that would be required for affordable and 44 for rental. And uh, on those, we'll, uh, we'll be uh, purchasing and buying out on the 13 for sale, but on the 44, we will be buying out 33 and we will provide, we'll be providing 11 affordable units on site uh, at 60% of uh, adjusted uh, median income. The total of all of these requirements here uh, totals to be $13 million, $13,029,268, which is our payment to the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund. So, and, 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 and by doing that, we're then in compliance with the Affordable Housing Ordinance of the City of Chicago. The next slide, please. This last slide uh, depicts uh, the various economic and community benefits. Um, I wanted to say in the right now, if I could, that uh, one of the earlier slides talked about, and Noah handled it for the amount of uh, vetting this project went through and the number of community meetings. Uh, this project uh, did go through a number of community meetings. Uh, they, it was vetted substantially. In, the, in these meetings, we had a thousand people at the first meeting and, and a significant sum at the second big community meetings. Uh, we then had a whole series of other meetings too, in order to listen to the community and to and, and hear what they had to say, as well as to hear what the Department of Development and Planning had to say, as well as Alderman Brendan Riley. Uh, what you've heard today, what has been depicted in all of these exhibits shows what is the result of all of that input. Uh, and, uh, and I can't, uh, I want to express on behalf of, of my clients uh, the amount of thanks that we have to the Department of Planning uh, for over this two and a half year run that we've had for all the input that they've given us together with like the Department of Transportation and of course, Brendan Alderman Brendan Riley. He has uh, worked with us from the very time we started on this. Uh, we have gone through so many hearings uh, and meetings to make sure that what was being presented ultimately to the Plan Commission would be a product that was the result of everyone's input. And, uh, and that's what we have here today. Uh, I, and so I really extend our appreciation to, to everyone for, for all the time and effort. Uh, uh, it has been a, a work in progress for, for two and a half years. And, it's, uh, and we, we are really very, very proud of what we've achieved here. And the result, it's ended up with uh, 5,500 new construction jobs between the new building and the existing Tribune building. The cost of this project here is $700 million, which is the total development cost. There'll be 400 new permanent jobs created. The projection is $25 million in annual real estate taxes. Uh, you've heard uh, Brad talk about the improved design for the public use of Pioneer Court. This is something that uh, uh, Commissioner Cox got involved in, as well as Alderman Brendan Riley, uh, with the changes that we've made and what were depicted here in these exhibits today show the significant change that we've made to create more green space. And it's, we, we're very proud now of the way Pioneer Court and the public use will be of that particular area. Uh, Gordon talked about the preser preservation of the Ogden Slip, which was very important from day one. That was a concern of everyone. The improved pedestrian experience at the lower street level, this is something that was brought up at the first community meeting. And people were very concerned about how that was going to be improved, what type of lighting, what kind of safety features. They were very concerned how that was going to be done. And so an awful lot of emphasis was put by the developer in this project as to how to restore that and, and make sure that we, we met the, the criteria that were being asked of us. Uh, as you can see and you've heard, there's with $15.1 million to the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. And that's, the, that's a different fund than the, uh, than the Affordable Housing Fund. This was the 15.1 15, $15 million is for the increase in the FAR, the 3.1, 3.31 FAR that we have acquired and we're paying for. So in total, you have between the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund and the Affordable Housing Fund, it's, there's $28 million being paid into these two different funds. Lastly, but not least, of course, is our goals of 26% um, participation of MBE and 6% of WBE. These were our goals. These are the goals that we're committing to, and that's why they're recited in this document. Uh, I, I have no further uh, statements myself. 
Um, but uh, we appreciate the time and energy that everyone has given to this project. Noah? Yes. Um, sorry, uh, for the record, I'm not sure what happened to my slideshow here. But uh, either way, we don't need that. I can just read them for you. So uh, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant. And we have concluded that this proposed development is appropriate on the subject site uh, for the following reasons. First, the proposal is in conformance with the central area plan that was adopted by the plan commission in 2003. Second, in furtherance of that plan, the proposed development respects the Ogden Slip View Corridor. Uh, third, the proposed underlying zoning for the proposed development is DX12. This is consistent with other zoning districts, both adjacent to the site and in the immediate vicinity of the site. The proposed development is compatible with surrounding commercial, retail, and residential de developments in terms of land use, as well as in terms of density and scale of the physical structures as proposed. Uh, the project promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of, of the existing neighborhood. Uh, the project, as mentioned, promotes transit, pedestrian, and bicycle use. It ensures accessibility to the site for persons with disabilities, and it minimizes conflicts with existing traffic patterns in the vicinity with a series of traffic improvements. The proposal follows building orientation and massing guidelines of the Chicago Zoning Ordinance, and all sides and areas of the buildings that are visible to the public are treated with materials and finishes that are, are, that are of high quality. Lastly, copies of the application were circulated to other city departments and agencies, and the team has received uh, comments that have, have been addressed and nothing has gone unaddressed. Please refer to my staff report for further details on the project uh, and plans identified here today, but based on the foregoing, it's recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that the application to establish a residential business plan development be approved and forwarded as such to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Zafranek. Um, Commissioner Brumfeld. Well, first, I just want to say I think this is an uh, excellent and uh, uh, elegant um, addition to our skyline. So I want to commend uh, Gordon Gill, uh, also uh, commend Brad, uh, site design on the ground plan work that they've done. I do have a question uh, for, for Gordon. Uh, just out of curiosity, what is the, what's the uh, dimension of the base of the building? Roughly. I'm sorry, I didn't, hear the question. I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry, Commissioner. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, go, yeah, go, yes. Ahead. go ahead, Commissioner. Well, repeat the question. Well, yeah, um, uh, the question uh, was uh, just curious of what the uh, dimension of the base of the building is. It's a very narrow, uh, very elegant, slender uh, building in general, but uh, just out of curiosity, just wanted to know uh, what those dimensions were for that base. Um, I think we're probably at somewhere around 100, if my memory serves me, 120 feet. I'm sorry, can you can you state your name for the record? I'm sorry, uh, Gordon Gill, design partner, Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill Architecture. Commissioner, I think we're approximately four bays of 30 feet at the base of the tower. And I'm not sure if you heard my earlier statement, but I just want to commend you uh, on the design of this, this uh, building. It's an exceptional addition to our skyline. Very elegant design solution. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burnett. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I just want to ask one that's a beautiful building. I think it's very attractive. Um, and it's going to make a statement in the city of Chicago. I just want to ask, so I saw that you, uh, that uh, it's going to cost you, is it $700 million to build this? Was that right, what I saw? That's correct, Alderman. The construction cost is $700 million proposed. So, so does that $700 million include the uh, NOF funds and also the ARO funds? No, that's above and beyond that. So that's the cost of construction itself. And then beyond that would be the 13 million that uh, Mr. George highlighted for the ARO fee. And then the 15 million, 15.1 million that will go to the neighborhood opportunity fund. And what about the cost of the land? 
cost of the land is included in that? Uh, we may want to bring in the development team to answer that, just to make sure. Is the cost of the land in that? Do we need the developer to respond to that? Is there, are, did they, who on the development? No, it. Noah, 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 is Lee Golub connected on? Kamal, can you make sure Lee Golub is allowed in here? Sorry, I'm on my shared screen, so I can't get to that tab. Lee Golub is uh, is on here. I will unmute him. Thank you. Okay, and then also while they while they're looking at that, uh, also I'd like to know who's the general contractor. Can you hear me? It's Lee Golub. Can you guys all hear me? We can hear yes, you. Yes. yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Oliver Burnett, the, the first question uh, of the, the cost of the project is $700 million. It does include the land, and it, it's it's $700 million plus or minus, and that also does include the cost of the ARO and the uh, Opportunity Fund fee. Noah, I just wanted to uh, correct that. Also, it includes the Opportunity Fund Carol yes. fee? Yes, it does. So you're only going to do... So you're only going to do uh, how many units of ARO affordable housing on site? So on site, we have uh, uh, 400 plus units of rental, of which we're going to provide 11 on the affordable. And on the condominium, we have, uh, we're buying out 100% of that. The, the cost. So you're only, so you're only cost, doing, you're only yeah, doing 11 units out of 400? Okay. Yes. We're going to buy out of the. We're 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 going to comply with the ordinance, and we're buying out of uh, seventy five percent of that requirement, and and keeping the twenty five percent on on site, which equates to eleven units. So, how much are your units selling for? Well, the the units that will the, the condominium units will be selling for in excess of a thousand dollars a foot. They're relatively large units, over two thousand to three thousand square feet on average, so they're very expensive units. The, the rentals will be well over $4 a square foot. Again, this is, a, a, again, the, a, a premier piece of land, paid a lot of money for this site. The economics of this deal just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, warrant uh, economically in a pro forma for all that affordable to be on site. We're in the, the high rent district on Michigan Avenue here, and it's, it's very difficult to get that to work. To answer so, your question about... So you Contract. So you pay, you pay 700, 700 million. It co it's costing no. you 700 million. So you're looking to make how much off of this? Well, I don't think I don't think I want to get into what our what our underwriting is. The you know phase one is a five almost a six five hundred and seventy million dollar project in cost, and phase two is is going to be a seven hundred plus million dollar project in cost, which includes it is common now as we paid over two hundred million dollars for the land and the assets that we have. Okay. Very this, uh, piece of real estate. Who, who is the con who is the contractor? So uh, the contractor for phase two, which is what we're talking about here, we do not have yet. We've been talking to three to four uh, about again who, who are qualified to do very tall towers. Um, this, who are they? Um, I don't know if I'd uh, like to say that in a public forum here. I'd, I'd rather not. It's uh, but it's it's big names that that you've heard of on the general contracting side who have built tall towers in the city of Chicago and around the country and around the world. So, so you haven't spoke to them yet, which means they haven't committed to doing the, uh, the MBE and the WB. No, we're way too early for that. We, all we have so far in design is what you're seeing here in conceptual drawings. This, this project won't break ground at the earliest until fourth quarter problem of 2021, which would be uh, very quick to sometime in 2022. We've got a lot of design effort to go into this before, and then we would pick our general contractor and then the general contract, we've worked with the, the subs and the NDE and the WB, but we're just, we're, we're probably 12 to 18 months ahead of that. Mr. Bala, would you start video on? Is that possible? So what about the uh, first phase? The first phase, uh, Walsh Construction is doing it. Um, they've uh, 
I mean, we've been under construction for well over a year now, and we expect to deliver uh, the first units in the property in February of 2021. So Walsh Construction is working right now? Yes. So, is Walsh, so you don't know if Walsh Construction is going to be considered in the uh, second phase? Uh, they've been... They're, they're obviously one of the GCs that will be considered, but uh, again, we're not making any commitments yet. It's too soon. So have they met the, have they met the uh, MBE and WBE guidelines, the, the 26 and 6? Um, I believe that, again, the, I don't have that information with me. They, they, they have strived for that. I don't have the numbers. Um, we can get that for you. Can you put the video on, please, for Mr. Golub? Um, and on this line of questioning, isn't it typical that we do have these commitments at this, even at this point in time? Well, this was, this was a little bit different because on phase one here, that's, that's might, what I Jack, you might want to explain what, what's happened on, on phase one and the timing of this. I'm, I'm, Mr. Gullab, are you on the telephone or do you not have access to your video? I, I think I do. Hang on one second. Well, they got the picture up. They don't, they're not showing. They have the. Now, I think now we have them. Do you have me now? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, on phase one, again, uh, this plan development, we were expecting this whole project to be one plan development, but with the, uh, with the tower and the, and the delays and the community meetings, we, we went under as of right zoning for phase one because we had a 16 FAR on, on the A parcel and a 12 FAR on the B parcel. And we went to Alderman Riley, we, we asked to uh, zone the whole property DX12 um, through a PD. But timing wise, when we bought the property, we ended up starting construction as of right on the first phase of the project. Thus, we're now catching up with regard to the affordable uh, on, on phase one and making payments for the affordable on phase one when we when we start phase two over here because now it's going to be part of the PD. So did you do any affordable? Do you have no. any affordable being built? Not in phase one. We will not be, at all. Also, it's all condominium in phase one. There's no rental. It's all for sale product in phase one, and we will be uh, buying out of that as well. Mm -hmm. So so I, I I really would like to see your numbers. I like to see Walsh's numbers. Uh, for phase one and seeing if they're meeting all of the criteria. Um, I like I like for you to consider this is a very large project, probably yes. one of one of the largest ones in the city of Chicago. And it's gonna this work would be going on for how long? Two years, maybe It'll more. Be, this, this this will be three years plus this building. Yeah. It'd be good if your general contractor would joint venture with someone. Uh, Walsh Walsh is joint venturing with African American contractors in my ward right now. Uh, yes. and, and probably all those other guys that's bidding with you. If they would joint venture with guys, they would cover their the requirements of the 30% or 25 and six or whatever the case may be. And, and we won't have to check on them because they already have a partner who would cover everything else. I think that's a wonderful idea. Hang on. <laughs> um, that's a wonderful idea. And, and, uh, Again, it's just too early for us to, to be with you know, those GCs, but those discussions when we get into it with them. And as I said, instead of naming names we've been talking to, they're, you know, they're, they're all big, big powerful uh, GCs that can build this kind of project and have done JVs like that um, in the past. So that's definitely something that we will keep in, in mind as we get to that point in the project. So in this phase, there's a hotel also, right? Yes, there is. How, how many rooms in a hotel? Right now, we have a plan for 200 keys, a five-star high-end hotel to go along with the high-end nature of the property. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, with what's going on in the hotel world right now, we, we've been speaking to groups all along since day one when we purchased this property. Um, obviously, right now, with what's going on with hotels, it might be a little bit more difficult, but we're hoping that uh, by the time we get to the point where we start real design here that we'll have somebody at least on board with us of the groups that we've been talking to that they'll still be around so that we can design to their specs and, and continue with that part of the project. So we think it's an important, important aspect of the project with the, the high end nature of what's going on here. Uh, as, again, as far as a location for a hotel over here, this is in the heart of it. Um, so, but I just, 
obviously with COVID and what's happening in the hotel industry, I just I can't foresee that 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 near term future for sure for sure, but uh, hopefully long term future is still viable. So if that was a change, would you would you you would probably revert to um, to maybe uh, rental or, or condos? Yeah, I, if we if we. If we didn't have a hotel for whatever reason, we'd probably look at the mix of the rental and the, and the condo again. Again, right now, this is this is planned as 200 keys, 460, I think, uh, uh, rentals and 125 condos. Uh, the condos are taking the bulk of the height of the building and that's on purpose to try to create you know, fantastic views. Um, but yeah, this is this is where we're at today and, and hopefully we'll be out in the future. But as you know, it's it's tough to predict in today's world. It is. It's also tough to predict if you would be able to sell uh, condos. Uh, that's that's, so, that's correct so, as well. So, um, what if, so, so Noah, I wanted to ask if he had to change the configuration of what's going to be going on in the building, whether it's, be, whether it's condos and or hotels and it, it has to be turned to rental, uh, do they have to come back and see us? Yes, we would require that. The PD has written today has a maximum of 750 units, 152 in the existing Tribune building, and 564 for the proposed tower. If they mm -hmm. were to need more than three units, they would trigger a mandatory trip back for an amendment to the plan commission. And then that would mean they would have to do do more affordable to meet the 25%. So, so the 25% nor uh, or whomever can answer this, the 25% is a, is a base, it's not the uh, limit, is it? I mean, they can do more than that if they wanted to. Uh, I'm not sure what the 25% is. What, what, what 25%? Jack, Jack, you want to take over? It's, it's 25% of the 10% has oh, the 10 to be on site. Yeah, 25% of the 10%. Oh, the 10%. So, so it's, the, it's, the, it's the least that you have to do. Yes. But you could do more if 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 economically it made sense in a pro forma. Then then the answer is yes. Again, we're hoping not to have to change this program, Alderman. As you know, uh, time 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 kills deals, and 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 uh, you know whatever happens. But this is this is where we're at in today's uh, point in time with with this program. Um, again, the high end hotel, the rental units, and the condos. Well, I think we're going to come back. We're going to continue probably some, Thank of, you. some of this line of questioning. And Commissioner Burnett, you can uh, follow up some more in a bit here um, if you if you want to. And I think I saw Commissioner Nevada's hand, Nevada's hand go up. So I suspect she's going to have something to say about the, um, about the affordable housing requirements. But first, I'm going to go to Commissioner Villegas, and then to Commissioner Searle, then to Commissioner Nevada, and Commissioner Burnett, if you still have some questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is more kind of similar in line with uh, my colleague, uh, Alderman Burnett, related to uh, participation and um, was wondering um, with, with, the, with the goals that are put out there, uh, is, there any, is there any consideration of not just utilizing uh, the construction firms, but also the professional services side of things where uh, your architects, your MEPs, um, where there could be some additional participation, uh, given that this is uh, a really large uh, project. There, uh, without question. I mean, I'm trying to trying to get myself here centered, but without question, that would definitely be something that we would we entertain on the service side for sure. Okay, and then on the design side, um, design and service side, basically, yes. Okay, all right, and then the. Uh, uh, you know, the, the contractors that typically uh, perform on these type of projects um, typically do work in the, some of them do work in the public sector as well and are very well yes. versed on some of the things that we try to accomplish. So I hope that um, that they're, that you guys have, and I, you, the developer or the owner, have a robust plan in place for your contractors, your GCs, to make sure that they are taking a look at um, this inclusion of uh, MWBE firms on this type of project and really setting the, the tone because really you're, you're the, as the owner uh, of this property, you're the one that sets the tone as to uh, what can actually be accomplished. Um, so I hope that, um, that that's the message that you're relaying to your, 
to your GC that we want to see some robust participation and participation, whether it be in the form of uh, joint ventures um, or uh, just any you know participation that's robust. Uh, as I told Alderman Burnett, this project warrants a, a, a GC that has, um, hopefully somebody will get that, uh, that has done a lot of work in the public sector, has done a lot of work in the ventures with WV and MBE, and also it hit strides for, for the WV MBE requirements. We will hire a consultant on our behalf as well to make sure that that does happen. Uh, and certainly, you know, we're being a responsible developer in the city of Chicago for many, many, many years. We, we understand we understand that, and it's a very important issue. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't say that I want to congratulate my colleague, even though he's not on the phone, Alderman Riley, for this project. And then I also um, want to congratulate you, too, given the, the current climate that we're in, uh, looking at this and, and doubling down on Chicago, which I think is important. Uh, just demonstrates the res res resiliency that our city has. And, and uh, I look forward to, to, to working with you to make sure that as many Chicagoans as possible from all parts of the city have an opportunity to participate in this project, whether it be through the subcontracting opportunities, <clears throat> but also in the workforce as well. And so I would hope that DPD uh, could identify uh, point people that we can talk to and point uh, firms that are interested in people that are seeking uh, employment opportunities too, so that way we can put them in a position to part to participate uh, on these on this beautiful project that is going to uh, redefine uh, the city skyline. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, thank you uh, for you and Alderman Burnett for for uh, pushing this issue around the MBEs. Uh, before I go to uh, Commissioner Searle, I want. Um, 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 Nancy Radovich, is there anything you need to add or feel that we need to have on the record with respect to the MBE expectation? And if so, you can go ahead and speak. And if you don't, I'm assuming that we're good on that one. So, okay, so let me go to Commissioner Searle um, and then to Commissioner Nevada. And then I have a, I have a, a, a question slash comment. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Charles. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just, first of all, I'd like to say that I, and I, I don't compliment too many architects on their projects, but I, I do think that um, the design is very well done and, and very well thought out. Um, and the garage facade looks totally fascinating. So I'm hoping it will be uh, when we get to walk by it. Um, I do think that 11 out of 400 units um, is pretty sad. Um, and this probably, I think the thing that this points out is the need for a more equitable, affordable housing um, policy by the city and um, maybe even by uh, agreements among the aldermen. Um, I know Alderman Burnett, for instance, has a 20% requirement. Uh, which means that they can buy out of 10, but at least they still have another 10 percent, you know, of affordable housing. So to only have 11 out of 400 is is just seems um, like a bad way to start with this. Um, but I think the project is great. The the uh, also the park um, looks wonderful to be able to walk through and to hang around on. So we'll look forward to seeing this get built. Thank you very much, Commissioner Searle. Uh, Commissioner Nevada. Okay. Nope. All right, I think I'm officially unmuted. Um, so I, I wanted to just jump in and those who've been present for our in-person meetings um, have heard things along these lines from me before as relates to the affordable housing requirement uh, on this project and i think there's a couple things going on here just to give a little context one is that this is a mix of for sale and rental and on the for sale side we have always struggled to provide on-site affordable units when it is a luxury for sale um, the reason for that is that even though we can, we can force the for sale price to be 
low enough to be affordable, we do not control the assessments of the building. And so it's not a viable situation when we're talking about a luxury for sale to do a for sale unit within that structure. We do have, and it's on our agenda later, we do have, um, for instance, a, a for sale project much further west where all of the for sale unit, the affordable units are, are for sale on site and we're, and we're able to do that, but that's at Pulaski and Belmont and, and it's, it's a very different situation. So because we can't um, feasibly make the for sale units in that context affordable, um, we, we do then um, accept the in lieu payment uh, in that instance. On the rental side, I will just point out again that um, the 25% of the 10% requirement is a vestige of the, of the 2015 ARO um, rules. That is what it, we are working on through our affordable inclusionary housing task force to revisit. But as of today, that is, that is, they are following the guidelines. Thank you so much, Commissioner Nevada. Um, let me return just before I make my comments and before I call upon Commissioner Cox, uh, let me return for a second to the MBE question. Noah, do you have a, a clarification for us? Sure, I just wanted to touch on some of the concerns it sounded that the commissioners had. So while they you know, have started an interior renovation project under their as of right zoning, the fact that they're now creating a plan development necessitated uh, that they uh, come in line with the city's goals and standards and they have submitted all the documentation associated with that. So if they are deficient, they'll have to make up. So let's say Walsh cannot meet the 26% goals. If they only hit 24%, 22%. It's going to be an obligation on the development team that the remainder of the site have higher goals to make up those difference. And then there are two other reporting periods. So as the applicant comes in and applies for their building permits through what we call the part two process, they have to reaffirm those forms and resubmit those forms, which would then be updated with the uh, uh, contractors that have come on board since today to that period of time. And then once again, there's a third period at the end of the project when they're applying for their certificate of occupancy, they're supposed to report out an actual um, detailed report of how, uh, how and who have been working on the site and what hours they've done, and they'll do that through the building department. Okay, so good, thank you. So there, there is a very clear um, expectation and mandate, if you will, to follow up on this, that's great. So my question, uh, again, before I go to Commissioner Cox, is, a, is, a, is on a little different note. Um, I wanna also commend um, the work of the, the landscape architects. Um, as usual, their work is, 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 is uh, always uh, stellar. Um, but I, I, I want to uh, speak a minute about the Pioneer Court. It's nice to hear that that's gonna be revived and uplifted. And, uh, but I, I wanna call attention to a couple of things and, and make it a request um, that when you do this, that you be sure and include in there Kitty Hawa um, as um, one of the, uh, a, a very key figure in Chicago history. Um, so, um, she, she, for many of you who don't, for who, those of you who may not know, this was the woman that Jean Baptiste um, de Saab married. Um, and so I think uh, she was a Potawatomi um, woman. And I think it's important that her name be in that pioneer. But I think along with that, I think it would be very appropriate. And I'm hoping you would agree to also include in the, in this uh, pioneer court, include the um, a kind of a, a, a um, a land acknowledgement, something that acknowledges who were the indigenous people that were settled here. We often think of, of uh, Europeans as having uh, been the first settlers of Chicago, but I think we need to really acknowledge in something that's saying it's a, it's a you know, the pioneer court, which itself right, has connotations, but I think we really need to have land acknowledgement in there. So I'm asking that um, as, um, as site design continues their always wonderful work, if they would be sure and include uh, the land acknowledgement and a specific uh, space there to acknowledge um, Kitty Hawa. So, one quick comment on that. This is Brad McCauley with Site Design Group. Thanks again. 
Um, really good feedback. Uh, some of the more granular detail of the design. We, there is a, a kiosk planned for Pioneer Path that really honors the history of the site. So I would say um, absolutely. We want to make sure that we're, we're considering that. And uh, we are getting into the stages of, you know, hardlining the, the pioneers along Pioneer Path. So absolutely for consideration. Yeah. Thank you. I figured you guys would be open to that. Um, Commissioner Cox. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a few comments to the both development and design team. Uh, this this um, high rise skyscraper um, certainly um, has been uh, years in the making, and uh, it's it is um, so it's great uh, to arrive and uh, and see. Um, how the process uh, uh, appears to be working in terms of um, Chicago's, you know, dominance of tall buildings and, and innovation uh, and that all of the parties involved um, uh, have brought it to this point uh, where uh, Chicago is going to have a signature uh, elegant uh, tall building. Um, I, 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 you know, I can only think of um, when the, Han when the Hancock building em emerged on the scene and the ground that it broke and, and the Sears Tower and the ground that it broke. And I, I feel in many ways, and this is uh, really a compliment to the, to the architect, I think you are uh, setting yet another groundbreaking building in a highly visible um, place that um, I think remakes the Chicago skyline. So uh, congratulations to you uh, for that work. Um, I particularly like, um, you know, the, the deference uh, that it um, makes to the um, original Tribune Tower. Uh, I think uh, those long views from uh, various kind of view sheds in the city um, will continue to highlight the, the Tribune Tower, even uh, if a tower emerges much, much taller uh, than it. So I think that's just, uh, it's very, very skillful on the part of the team. Um, I also think that uh, the attention that was paid to the, um, the parking podium um, is uh, going to be incredibly elegant uh, to get some depth and some, some rhythm uh, that will, uh, I think, complement the, the facade of the uh, Tribune Tower. So uh, I think that was an important, uh, important development. Um, and then I'll say uh, really to, um, to Alderman Riley uh, and uh, and uh, the the design team, um, uh, I appreciate uh, the willingness to go back and rethink the plaza um, because you know there's such a dearth of green space uh, down uh, in downtown. So the creation of a plaza that's that's more landscape uh, than hardscape escape is um, is something that the uh, alderman was advocating for. And I completely concur. And I think um, site, site Design Group did an extraordinary job. Uh, I can imagine lingering in that space. Uh, and I think it's going to be an amazing addition to the kind of urban, uh, urban landscape. Um, and so uh, I, I will say, uh, I, I'll just mention, I think that, you know, uh, one of the lessons we all take away from the, the presence of these ordinances uh, like the affordable housing ordinance, is that um, development, the development community will comply to the rules uh, that you establish. Uh, and so, you know, to Commissioner Navarro's point, uh, they are complying to the rules that sound maybe made sense five years ago, uh, but what a difference five years makes in the life of a community. And I'm just thrilled that uh, Commissioner Navarro is looking at that ordinance to change it so that it's relevant to the times we live in and so that we can have an increase in diversity of housing options and price points uh, in, uh, in buildings, particularly uh, downtown. So I really look forward to the, to the ordinance changes that she is uh, making. Um, I would uh, say that I am happy to know 20, what was it, 20, uh, was it 28 million? Um, is going into assuring affordability 
elsewhere in the city and uh, will support um, many, many, many new businesses uh, in the neighborhood. So to that extent, the, um, the larger city is uh, benefiting. Uh, neighborhoods outside of the downtown uh, is benefiting because of this building. So um, I, I, I just feel that we're, we're looking at uh, a really um, unusual opportunity. These opportunities don't come along very often. And I just want to commend all of the parties uh, involved for uh, bringing us to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. And just to clarify, Commissioner Nevada won't be making changes to the um, ordinance. That is something that is the purview of the uh, city council, but, but well, uh, she, I agree that's very important and um, laudable that she will be bringing some ideas forth for the, for the council to consider. So I'm not, oh, I guess I do see one more hand. Commissioner uh, Reyes? Yes, I'm sorry. I really want to say um, it's a beautiful building, but disappointed with the outcome when it comes to affordable housing. And I do understand that the developer is. Our first freeze. <laughs> Let's give her a second here. Did we lose her? I think we may have lost, we may have lost her. Does any other commissioner want to make a comment or ask a question while we're giving her a chance to get back on? Uh, this is Fran Grossman. Can you hear me? Oh, we can. Go ahead, Commissioner Grossman. Uh, this is not, this is more of a comment. I think it's probably time when we, uh, in the next few months, that we really get back to what the goal of the affordable housing is. Um, we get caught up in the numbers and not thinking, what did, what do we today in this year expect from it? Is it a way to put one person in a very expensive apartment in a luxurious building is that is that our goal are we trying to put more people in buildings where there are maybe better schools or are what are we trying to do because we argue or discuss but without thinking about what our goal is and i think we as a we ha we can take on the responsibility of deciding what the goal should be I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss um, um, some of that when we um, when the new when new, more changes are brought before us. But I think thinking about the purpose of it overall. And for the record, um, Noah, can you repeat the amount of money that's going to be put into the affordable housing fund? Uh, it's just over 13 million for the inflow fees in the two projects. Well, well, maybe we could have a report. What have we accomplished? What has happened? Reaffordable housing in the last two or three years. I mean, I think it's an opportunity, and are we making the most of the opportunity? That's a great. That's a great idea, um, and that reminds me of something else too, which is that we had we had on our. I'm not sure which meeting it was. We did have an agenda. <laughs> Do you know what day it is? Yeah. Uh, May eighth. I do have that. That <laughs> it's Harry I Truman. Yeah, because I knew we had a commission meeting on May eighth. So Harry I, Truman was born on May eighth. But every other day has kind of run into each other. So um, no, I know. <laughs> but, uh, we are we are going to have at some point also, if not the May meeting, probably the May meeting. I've got to talk. Nancy and I talked about this, but I don't remember what we said. She's going to come back with a report. Um, on the MBEs, and I, th I think some of the commissioners have asked for that. So we'll get we'll get the update on on the MBE report, and if we can get a, a report as Commissioner um, Grossman is asking for us on the um, on the affordable housing as well, that will be okay. Thank you. So Commissioner Reyes, uh, are you back on? Did you want to finish any of your comments? Um, I'm sorry, yes, I don't know how, but my internet is unstable, even though I have a special system here, but um, um, I just want to briefly mention that um, that I was disappointed with the minimum commitment, that was all. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion on the proposed plan development application to rezone the... Do 
there are a few more hands. I don't know if you want to get to that. And a couple of people oh. dropped down. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had to let back in. Alderman Burnett uh, had a battery die. He should be back in now. And I believe um, Commissioner Navarra, I had to let her back into the room now, too. Okay, but I'm not saying I saw I, uh, Commissioner Searle had her hand up. Did you want to say something else, Commissioner? Uh, yes. I just wanted to say that I think you know, someone said we should have a goal. You know, what, what are the goals? I think it, Commissioner Grossman, and um, I was going to say to me, the goal is that we have as um, equal a spread of uh, um, affordable housing across the city as we could possibly have. And that includes the downtown. So, you know, if that's not a goal, then I, I guess I'm curious to know what they are, what the goals are. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I think the point was we should discuss it. I think that's a good goal, but I think we can have more than one goal and we should just revisit it with a discussion. I don't think any of us are going to disagree, but we need to say, you know, okay, these four or five things we want to accomplish. And did we accomplish two of them, three of them, one of them? You know, we just yeah. need to rethink it. Well, and some of that is going to be uh, affirmation as well, but, uh, but, uh, but Either way, I, I, I think uh, um, it sounds like it'll be good to, to reaffirm and perhaps we elaborate on some of those goals. So I'll look forward to Commissioner Searle and Grossman and Nevada. And yeah, no. I, I think we'll all we'll come to some, it'll be a really interesting discussion and we'll come to, come to some good points. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I don't see any other hands. Am I missing? Okay, one just went up. Commissioner Burnett. Just, just want to um, let you all know that the uh, we have a, a, four, a ARO task force going on right now. Fantastic. Uh, right, and um, Commissioner Navarro is in charge of it. Um, I think some folks from uh, Bigger Diet is on the board. Joy is on the board. Uh, I would say that... Uh, uh, maybe this body need to make some recommendations and, um, and we see if the task force can take some of those things into consideration. I think that uh, a lot of the things that, that some of us are concerned about, uh, the task force is too. Um, but we're trying to balance them out and, um, you know, and the development community is on that task force also. And uh, each time we put the ARO together, we, we try to help folks without hurting other people. And, uh, and I think uh, hopefully soon we'll come up with some type of recommendations and conclusion. But again, um, that, that probably will come before this body. But, but I think that uh, if people on this body is in interested in making some comments or some suggestions, I think you may want to share it with, uh, with the commissioner and maybe we can uh, incorporate that in some of our conversations. Fantastic, thank you so much for bringing that to us and to the public record. Um, Commissioner Novada. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Burnett, who is a very active member of our inclusionary housing task force. Um, I think I had my hand up and then I, um, I lost my hand somehow in that. So thank you for all of the commissioner's interests in uh, the goals of the affordable requirements ordinance. I just want to say a couple things um, because it often does get lost that the point oh <laughs> of the affordable requirements ordinance is that it is inclusionary housing. That means that we are trying to get affordable housing in parts of the city that lack it. We are trying to reduce Chicago's profound racial and economic segregation. We are trying to establish an equitable distribution of affordable housing. And unfortunately, uh, we are dependent on in lieu fees uh, to do many of the other things that the Department of Housing does, such as provide housing to people making 30% of the area median income and below through the trust fund. So those are all of the things that our inclusionary housing task force is working to balance. We're happy to uh, come back to this body with our recommendations when we have them. Thank you. Thank you so much. This ended up being very, very fruitful and important to get all this onto the uh, public record. Um, sounds like y'all are doing great work and we'll look forward to, to that coming back to us. Thank you so much. Now, do I have a motion on the proposed, oh, I'm sorry, I don't think I said it for the record. Um, Alderman Riley did submit a written record in written statement in support of this. Is that, that's correct, right, uh, Noah? Second. 
That's correct. Yes, okay. there's a letter in file. Okay, so the letter in file. Um, do I have a motion on the proposed plan development application to rezone the subject property from DX-12 downtown mixed use and DX-16 downtown mixed use to a unified DX-12 downtown mixed use and then to a residential business plan development. The application would allow for the development of a mixed use building 1,442 feet in height, not the tallest, uh, containing 564 dwelling units as well as 200 hotel rooms on the east portion of the site. The overall plan development will contain 726 dwelling units, 687 accessory vehicular parking stalls and 14 loading berths to allow for the construction of a new two-story commercial building, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved by Commissioner Shaw. Do I have a second? Second by Commissioner Searle. Any further discussion on the on the motion itself? Uh, Commissioner Lyons uh, is recusing herself for this vote, and I will do a um, a roll call. Okay. So Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Um, Commissioner Rumsfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Gross Grossman. All right, thank you. Commissioner Grossman? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, I couldn't hear the no, no vote at all. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Light. But is not here. Commissioner Lyons is recusing herself. Commissioner Moore. Yes. And we have a, a, a the form on file for, for Commissioner Lyons. Um, Commissioner Moore is a vote yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada. Yes. Commissioner Osterman. Welcome back. Commissioner Peterson is not here. Commissioner Reyes. No. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Yes. Commissioner Spazzoni is not here. Commissioner Tunney, we have a proxy vote in the affirmative. For Commissioner Tunney. Uh, Commissioner Villegas? Yes. Uh, Commissioner White as well? Yes. The motion passes. Um, congratulations, um, and we hope that you will um, go forward with all the things in mind that we have. Congratulations. We have one last item on the agenda before the very short chair's report. The last item on the agenda is a proposed amendment to business plan development number 376, submitted by 320 South Canal Title Holder LLC for the property generally located at 320 South Canal Street, sub area C. The applicant proposes to increase the allowable height from 715 feet to 730 feet incorporate vacated right away into the net site area and purchase 46,143 square feet of floor area through the neighborhood opportunity fund bonus to construct a commercial building with a total floor area ratio of 17.11 and 400 accessory vehicular parking spaces in sub area C. The subject property is in the 42nd board. Emily Thrun will provide the context overview and the applicant will present the proposal. Thank Ms. you. Thrun? Thank you. For the record, my name is Emily Thrun with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant appears here today because they are proposing to increase the allowable building height from 715 feet to, seven, to 730 feet, incorporate vacated right away into the net site area, and purchase additional floor area through the neighborhood opportunity bonus fund to construct a commercial building with a total floor area ratio of 17.11 and 400 accessory vehicular parking spaces in sub area C in plan development 376. The plan development was last amended in October of 2018 to approve the 715 foot tall office building in sub area C. The applicant has filed an amendment to this plan development in February of this year to incorporate vacated right away to increase the net site area, 
increase the building height by one floor and purchase an additional 0.5 FAR through the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund bonus for the proposed office building in sub area C. The site is located in the city's near west side community area in the 42nd Ward. Alderman Riley has provided a letter of support for this amendment. The PD is bound by West Adams Street to the north, South Canal Street to the east, West Van Buren to the south, and South Clinton Street to the west. The site is bisected by Jackson Boulevard. The northern portion of the planned development, subarea A, includes the Chicago Union Station headhouse. The southern portion of the PD includes the Union Station Transit Center in subarea B. This center serves as a terminal for several CTA bus lines. South of the transit area is subarea C, the site for the proposed office tower and public plaza that was approved in October 2018. The site is approximately one block north from the CTA Clinton Blue Line stop and four blocks west from the CTA Quincy Brown, Pink, Orange, and Purple Line stop. The site is also served by numerous CTA bus lines and is also located a block north of I-290 and three blocks east of the I-90-94 expressways. The site is currently zoned Plan Development 3 76, and the site is primarily surrounded by office and residential uses. The zoning districts in the immediate area are DC-12, DX-7, DX-16, and DX-12, and the following plan developments, 27, 756, 1191, and 1063. Now I will turn the presentation over to Jack George, the applicant's attorney who will further explain the details of the proposal. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, this is Jack George on behalf of the developer. Uh, the slide that you have in front of you, uh, the purpose of this slide, as Emily just pointed out, one of the things we're doing by this amendment is to incorporate the purchase of the area, the area that we just purchased, which is a right-of-way purchase. Uh, if you can look on this, you'll show, you'll show the you can see the October 8, 2018 approved PD, and then the right is the uh, April 2020 proposed amendment. And that little box that's called out shows the right of way that we have purchased from the city of Chicago. Next slide, please. This next slide shows that the right of way that we have now created and we have purchased from the city has allowed us to expand the size of the park and move the building a little bit farther to the east. Raphael uh, from the developer will get on now and explain these changes from an uh, architectural standpoint. Raphael, are you on? You hear me? I'm muted. Commissioner, uh, Mr. Mr. We can hear you, Mr. Madam, uh, Madam Chairman, could you unmute uh, Raphael? Yeah. Now I'm good. Yeah. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Um, as we've spent a busy day listening to many um, zoning projects. My name is Rafael Carrera. I'm with Riverside Investment and Development. I'm an executive vice president uh, by way of introduction. I'll spend a few minutes here to go through the slides. Um, as Emily uh, has explained and Jack also hit on, these are just a couple things that side-by-side -side comparisons of the changes that we're asking with this proposed amendment. The first one, as Emily indicated, is increasing the building height by approximately uh, 15 feet. Uh, we've also changed the configuration of the building. You can see from this sketch a little bit, it really was a design uh, series of decisions and co consultation with the engineers um, and the elevator consultants and the various consultants that we brought on board to design the building. As we got into the fine tuning, these changes uh, seem to make a lot of sense. Next slide. This again is a comparison of the, uh, the uh, east elevation of the building. On the right side, you'll see the proposed amendment. There's no change in materials. There's no, no change in expression. It's really just addressing the added floor as Emily pointed out, as well as the uh, slightly different uh, shifted floor plates uh, that I ident identified on the earlier slide. Next slide, please. 
This is the west elevation. Again, you'll see really no changes in terms of expression. Uh, this is all very pretty straightforward um, and uh, I think very well self-explained. Next slide. This is the north elevation. Again, repeating my, my earlier comments, um, no, no change in expression, just adding the height and adding the uh, floor as I outlined. And then the final elevation is the south elevation. Again, doing the same thing. Uh, there is no other change in terms of the design of the building. Uh, the, the, the landscaped area on the west portion of the building is the same, uh, no changes in parking, uh, things like that. So this is really just a change to make the two uh, I items that uh, Emily has identified. Next slide. And then this is just really a comparison of the bulk tables that identifies uh, the increase in site area, which is the uh, third, the second line that's highlighted in yellow, as well as just the overall change in FAR as identified first by purchasing the uh, right of way and secondly by adding the neighborhood opportunity uh, bonus. Next slide. Yes, this is Thank uh, you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Raphael. This is just a compilation and, and statement here of the public benefits that will be derived from this amendment uh, to this plan development. Uh, the building that was going to be going up now will create 1,500 construction jobs. There'll be 6,000 permanent jobs once this building is erected. We are paying in, we're, buying, we're purchasing 0.5 FAR, which will uh, results in us, us paying for to that a million seven seventy thousand five hundred dollars. What what is happening is we also now have the one point five acre public park in the city of Chicago easement. Uh, the city of Chicago we also paid one point six for the right of way that that little notched out corner that I talked about earlier. The annual projected real estate taxes for this building are seventeen million dollars. And one of the things that was required under the original PD, which still remains an obligation here, is the active traffic management program that we, we that we the developer has agreed to do, which involves uh, inserting pedestrian count sound signals and also providing for traffic control aids. Uh, all of those are uh, a responsibility that the developer has taken on with respect to the traffic management program for this project. And we also have extended the Union Station Parkway. Again, uh, we have here a 26 and 6 M 26 percent MBE and 6 percent WBE and 50 percent residency. Uh, this is something that is a commitment that's been made to us. This commitment appears in the plan development statements, and as was said earlier, this is there is there is uh, uh, provisions in the plan development ordinance and in the city's procedures how to monitor that MBE and WBE compliance. And that's what we intend to do and live up to our commitment as we have done with all of the other projects that we do in the city of Chicago. That's the extent of my presentation. Uh, Emily, back to you. Um, before you, before we go to Emily, uh, for the court, uh, I, mean, the, I mean, for the recorder, that was Jack George who spoke um, most yeah. recently. And I just wanna remind uh, the presenters when they do speak to, uh, indicate their name so that we get it for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Okay. Emily. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal would be appropriate for the following reasons. The project promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of the existing neighborhood. The new development will generate up to 6,000 permanent jobs. The proposal is, is in line with existing development patterns in the immediate area, which is predominantly office and residential. And additionally, the office tower is designed as a step three tiered building. The building has three main setbacks on the north face that will include terraces located on those setback floors. The office building will include amenity spaces, including terraces for its tenants. Additionally, the development will include the construction of a 1.5 acre public park that will provide significant public benefits to local residents, the downtown workforce, and visitors to the area. Additionally, the proposed development is compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of uses, density, and scale. Please refer to my staff report for further details on this project and plans identified here today. 
Based on the foregoing, the zoning administrator recommends that the application for an amendment to plan development 376 be approved and forwarded to the city council committee on zoning landmarks and building standards as such. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Thron. Uh, commissioners, any comments or questions? I'm not seeing any. Uh, do we, I believe we have a letter also on file from Commissioner, Ry I mean, Alderman Riley on this? That is correct. Yes. Um, well, I got to treat you like I treated the last one. So I like to know. Um, I ask you to start your video. I, I like to ask, um, uh, who's your con who's going to be your contractor? Tech, can we get a video uh, available? There you go. I'm unmuted. This is Rafael Carrera from Riverside Investment and Development. Our contractor on this is Clark Construction. Okay, Clark. Clark. Uh, Clark does some work in my ward, and they joint right now. They joint venturing with someone. Is it possible to see if, if Clark would joint venture with a minority contractor, uh, and it'll cover that that uh, requirement for the MBE and WBE? Um, well, uh, Alderman, yes, uh, we have awarded the contract to Clark. I am happy to report at a very early stage in the awarding of contracts for this job, because this is just getting started here. But um, as of some notes that I received from Clark Construction, uh, we have already awarded 23 contracts or sub subcontracts to MBE and WBE firms totaling uh, $28 million. This is so far, there's more to come. 14 of these were MBE firms and nine of these were WBE firms. In addition, uh, we have other contracts to firms that are recognized not by the city of Chicago, but by other national certifications, um, because in most cases they're too large to meet the city of Chicago requirements in terms of the size of the firm. There's another $54 million of contracts that have been already awarded. Um, we, as, as I think we've talked in the past, there's an aggressive program by our subcontractors that have been awarded to further uh, award contracts to sub subcontractors or suppliers or other service providers that would uh, increase our MBE um, uh, goal, MBE WB um, achievements as the job goes on. There's still, still time to go, but I think there's been a pretty aggressive program. Clark Construction has had a number of um, uh, job forums and opportunities where they've invited MBE and WBE firms specifically to meet with Clark and to learn about the opportunities uh, so that they can uh, participate to the extent they have the skill set and the um, uh, teams to do it. Thank you, Mr. Correa. Go ahead, Alderman. I mean, Commissioner Grant. He's speaking, but we're not hearing him. So. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to uh, get a list of those subcontractors that they uh, that they put on? This is Rafael Carrera, absolutely, Alderman. Um, I would like to provide that. I will provide that list to you separately, under separate cover, and uh, copy the planning staff as well as. Um, yeah, director. we can provide it to the chair. I think she'll provide it to all of us. Uh, okay. Also, uh, so this is a, a commercial building. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, and and um, do you have any end users going in there already? Um, Alderman, we have already. This is Raphael Carrera again. We have already signed uh, a lease with BMO Harris Bank. Um, obviously, a well-known uh, bank that has a long history in the city of Chicago. Uh, they are going to be occupying the lower portions of this building having uh, leased approximately uh, just under 500,000 square feet of space. They will be relocating uh, several locations in downtown Chicago um, into this building. In addition, we have uh, signed leases with two other tenants and are actively beginning a program uh, to reach out to more tenants. 
So, so do you find that that um, more of these um, commercial users are looking for more space because of the format that they have to have uh, now with with the distancing? They can't have people sitting on top of each other uh, like they used to. Are they asking for more space now? Uh, Rafael Carrera again. Alderman, that is an excellent question, and it is a question that has been asked by many people. I can tell you this pretty clearly. Most um, companies that are out there are re-evaluating -eval their uh, planning and their kind of their, uh, the way they think about their office space. Obviously, social distancing is a big concern, and until we understand COVID-19 and have a, a, a solid vaccine that is proven to address it, uh, social distancing, I think, will be with us for a, a period of time. Um, so I would tell you this, everybody, and, and we're obviously, in, as you know, Alderman, involved with a number of downtown commercial office buildings, everybody is revisiting their standards. And I think there will be a change, and I think companies will be looking to perhaps take some more space. But obviously, as you witnessed, you know, today they released further uh, st stats. There's been a lot of job loss. And it's, it's sad that, that people have been furloughed or lost their jobs because of this COVID-19. So we're hoping that uh, in the rebound here, as companies continue to build themselves, that um, we see a positive come out of this. I'll also say that one big factor um, as we're showing this building to prospective tenants is this building has a lot of health, healthy elements to it. Um, more air changes, as you understand ventilation is a big issue as you deal with this COVID-19, more air changes, um, more sunlight. Um, it, the building has already been pre-certified LEED Gold. We're gonna be pursuing well certification for the building. So we're trying to create an, uh, a healthy environment, not for everybody that comes, not, not just for the employees, but everybody that comes in the building. So, so I, I just one more question. Um, mm -hmm. So, so um, some of the things that we're starting to myself in the community have been asking uh, commercial developers in our area was that um, do you consider any affordable space for uh, smaller smaller retailers or or, or offices uh, in your building? And you know what that that may that may end up being uh, the way it goes anyway. But have you all considered consider something like that? Again, Rafael Carrera, uh, yes, we do consider space. Um, a lot of the larger tenants have what they call option space. So it's options, space that they can move in, they can grow into in five, seven, 10 years. Those spaces tend to be broken up. And this is what we recently did at 150. North Riverside and what we're doing at 111 or 110 uh, North Wacker. Uh, and those spaces are um, designed for smaller firms um, and, and really done in a very flexible way. We actually have a program where we actually will do a lot of the construction work for those smaller tenants because they don't have the capacity to do that on their own. Uh, so we try to make it easy for them. And obviously th this is really designed for, for, in our minds, the small companies that are growing for one reason or the other. Okay, fantastic, very nice project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alderman. Any more questions from commissioners? Uh, do I have a motion on the application for a proposed amendment to plan development number 376, which allows for the increase in the allowable height from 750 feet to 730 feet, incorporates vacated right of way into the net side area and accounts for the purchase of 46,143 square feet of floor area through the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund bonus to construct a commercial building with a total floor area ratio of 17.11 and 400 accessory vehicular parking spaces in sub area C, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Do I have a second? Second it by Commissioner Cox. Mr. Cox seconds. Any further discussion on this motion? Um, okay, let me do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova. Yes. Commissioner Cox. 
Yes. Mr. Flores. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Okay, Commissioner Kelly. Yes. Commissioner Kelly is a yes. Commissioner Lightfoot, not here. Commissioner Lyons is recusing herself. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. Commissioner Osterman is not here. Commissioner Peterson is not here. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Posada is not here. Commissioner Tunney is not here. Commissioner Villegas. Scott had to leave. As a Commissioner Tunney and Commissioner Wagespach. Yes. Yes. The motion passes. Congratulations. Um, so that I do have a very, very quick thing I want to say here as I do the look at the chair's update, but this does conclude the public hearing portion of our agenda. So on the chairman's update, I just want to fill it with some thank yous. I want to thank uh, Mr. Zanifrek um, for, for you, you did really an incredible job. Noah, I just really want to express um, our appreciation to you. Um, Noah has, has uh, moved into the role of, of serving the plan commission and you put a lot of thought, a lot of effort in preparing for this commission meeting, these two commission meetings, and it really showed. So I want to thank you and acknowledge you acknowledge that. Also, I want to thank and acknowledge the tech support. Um, you, it was awesome. I think this pretty much went off without hitch. Um, and along those lines, I want to thank the commissioners. Um, it was just really, really awesome working with you to prepare for this meeting. And um, uh, everybody was great and cooperative. And so I, I want to thank you. And then finally, I want to really um, express my great deepest gratitude to the leadership in our city and our state. Um, these are very difficult times. Uh, many people are, um, are suffering, losing loved ones. Um, and I know that this is a, a quite a difficult task, but they are doing a tremendous job. And so I wanna thank our leaders. And I also want to, to acknowledge and thank the many, what we now call, because they have always been our essential workers not only those in the medical medical services, but certainly uh, the delivery folks, the folks who um, are working in our grocery stores, the folks who are on, in the farm fields. Um, just there's so many people without whom the rest of us could not be uh, staying at home. So we, uh, and what we hope is that even uh, when we move into the various phases and, and on the other end of this, that we will never forget how critical all of these workers are um, and how important our leadership is to our ability to, to be connected as a human settlement in a city, in a state, um, and with a continued realization that how interdependent we all are and how much this collective consciousness is to our ability to, uh, to survive and move forward um, in our lives um, on this planet. So um, I'm filled with gratitude and I just wanted to thank, thank all of you and, and everyone. Um, and with that, I will um, entertain a motion for adjournment. I motion we adjourn. Oh, well, that was a very affirmative voice and I think it was Commissioner Moore, was it? Commissioner Moore. Commissioner Moore, there you go, Commissioner Moore. Seconded by Commissioner Navarra. Commissioner by, seconded by Commissioner Navarra. Thank you so much. All in favor, say aye. 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 I'm not even going to ask for any nays. Um, and with that, we are uh, adjourned at exactly three o'clock. Uh, go forward.